subtleties that you need to have now to, to work at that level is, is far surpassed with yeah. that. That's, you just, know. that's just crazy. Cause now I get how the standards have changed because technology has changed. I mean, even if I go back and look at like the original Cinderella, like I love that Prince Charming. He's still fine as hell to me. He's like the best looking prince, but yeah, it's just, you know, it's different when you're talking about different. like productions and what they expect from you, you know? So it's totally different. No, I get it. The original Cinderella was a while ago, but <laughs> yeah. Um, but that's because I, they focused so much on appeal. Everything had to be so appealing, like the drawings and the character designs. I know this is a writing thing, so I'll stop talking <laughs> about animation. We could do an animation thing later. <laughs> I'm just filling Aww. up the space till Steven gets here. Well, <laughs> I mean, a lot of uh, writing is animation. I mean, you were talking about the actual animation, but I mean, mm-hmm. a lot of writing goes into that. <laughs> yeah. Totally. I mean, animation can be a lot about acting or if you're doing visual effects animation, it's about recreating life as best you can. So physicality and, you know, just make self, making things feel photorealistic. The hell is this shit? Yes, the, um, the third toy, like, I feel like Toy Story as a franchise, like, it's not uncommon with a lot of animation movies, but... There's a lot of uh, adult things in them. Yeah, that are actually that are actually kind of deep. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> and you're like, what? It's like, how's the kids supposed to understand this? That's a big joke and about Disney's films. They they're always killing off a parent to do something super traumatic, <laughs> and your kids are like, oh, I'm ruined for life. <laughs> well, I'm ruined for life for the whole Prince Charming stuff. I grow up and there's no Prince Charming. I'm like, what? Yeah, you were lied to. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and guys aren't really like that. That's all. Yeah. Nope. <laughs> so well, Adam some are. devastated. So Adam is on. Adam is uh, Stephen's assistant, and uh, he informed me that uh, Stephen might be like five or ten minutes late. Uh, his electricity went out at his house. <laughs> Aww, that sucks. This that weather sucks. is no joke. Hey, Joe. Hey, everyone. Joe, I'm on. No. This is Elena. I'm on Didi Onsen. Didi on. I don't have my using camera on. Work. So. Oh work. yeah, I was trying to find you. <laughs> yeah, I'm using my work machine in my work account, so it's not going to say my name on it. But it's me. <laughs> okay. How are you, sweetie? I'm well. It's uh, 1 a.m. over here. <laughs> oh my God, girl. <laughs> I'm with my Coke and already had a coffee. So. <laughs> I've got at least one monster ready just in case I start dozing. Where are you? <laughs> well, I'm in Ohio. I have no excuse to be tired like she does. Oh. <laughs> I have it just in case. <laughs> oh, am- no. It's, it's, wait, what time? It's 8 p.m. Oh, it's so late. Hey man, I, <laughs> I love going. I love going to bed at like nine o'clock. So, <laughs> what are you it's, eating, Joe? Is that ice cream? It is. Uh, I have for whatever reason today. I decided to go to Sonic for the first time. Never been there. I was like, I want to go there today, so I did. It's uh, been there. There. That's the ice cream. Oh my god, I'm so jealous. And they closed the Sonic that is around me, oh. and um. It, it's a man, uh, their, their food, eh, but their drinks, oh my God. And their ice cream. You know, I'm, I'm agreeing. I was so excited. I got like a bunch of the random food choices. I was like, oh, this is not worth what I'm paying. I'm I'm going back to A&W after this. <laughs> <laughs> and now, especially that it's hot, like I'm in um, right outside of Philadelphia. So it's really oh, hot. Really humid. Oh, and about it. And human, so I would kill for one of them damn slushies right now, but it's what it is. Okay, closest Sonic here is Duarte, so it's like an hour away. Oh, far. Yep, that's yep, that's how I because there was one like 15 minutes and then they closed it, and I was like, well, it couldn't be because of COVID because I mean, their style was the food was brung to your car, it wasn't like you were eating inside with people, so I thought. They would like be good. If anything, their business would go up. But what do I know about business? Hello, Stephen. Hello, hello. Sorry about that. A little technical issue on my side. Problem. How you doing? Good, good. How are you? 
I'm all right. I'm all right. We've got a good little crowd for you. Fantastic. Sure it'll grow. <laughs> um, so Adam's here, although I can't see his face. <laughs> he, he's always around somewhere. Yeah. Um, and he, so I just want to thank you for joining us. Oh, my um, pleasure. You know, the greatest gift we can give is our time because, you know, we can't give it back. So I do appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. Um, so Joe down there is coast hosting with me today. Um, and I think she wanted to start off with the first question. Sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hi, Stephen. Um, I have one question for you is that I read that in an interview, you said that you actually gravitate more towards features, um, mm -hmm. but then that you ended up um, starting your career uh, at television. And I was wondering how that happened. Uh, <laughs> that's an interesting story. Yeah, so, uh, you know, I went to UC Santa Cruz as an undergraduate, that's um, uh, University of California at Santa Cruz, to study as an actor. Was I, I really wanted to be an actor back in those days. Um, and after a couple of years, I, I thought I was, an, I was an okay actor, but I wasn't great. So I started uh, writing instead. And then I ended up at the UCLA uh, playwriting program. I was writing uh, plays. And I, I went through that program, stuck around an extra year to go through the screenwriting program. Uh, because as much as I loved playwriting, uh, you know, talk about trying to make a living, that's, uh, I might as well be writing operas. It's really, really, really difficult. So when I got out of school, uh, I was writing spec screenplays. And I, you know, I thought it would be uh, six months and I would get some kind of uh, deal for my, my first movie. Um, and six and a half years later, I still hadn't gotten a break. I was, you know, writing, uh, I'd probably say about two features a year and uh, just couldn't get any traction. So I decided, uh, well, shit, I love television. I've always loved television. So at least as an exercise, I would try writing a spec TV pilot. So I had uh, two of my favorite shows at the time were NYPD Blue and Buffy the Vampire Slayer. And I had what I thought were really great ideas for both of them. And uh, I went back and forth, back and forth. And I thought, wow, well, you know, let me try this Buffy uh, script. And I wonder, my life would have been completely different if I had done NYPD Blue. Uh, uh, I, so um, uh, I, I'm sorry, I, I jumped ahead a bit. Uh, this was actually, I, at first I did a spec uh, Deep Space Nine script. I always forget about that one. Because uh, I, I was enjoying Deep Space Nine at the time, so I wrote this Deep Space Nine script, which ex basically explained why Ferengis were small. And it all centered around uh, Worf has this bar fight with a Ferengi that's bigger than he is. And that starts the whole thing going. And uh, so I finished this, and, you know, Star Trek at the time right. was very Ferengi open. Bigger than he he is. Uh, submissions from everyone. You could, anybody could submit a script. And I actually know some people that end up getting hired on the show that way. Uh, I submitted my script into a black hole, never heard anything back from anybody. And I also quickly discovered nobody in Hollywood wanted to read a spec Deep Space Nine script, nobody. And so I went back to working on my feature specs. And then about a year later, I got a call from a friend of mine from UC Santa Cruz. He, he works on the production side and he was a production coordinator for an MTV pilot called Undressed, if anybody remembers that show. Uh, if you don't, it was a uh, teen sex comedy that was on four nights a week um, and bizarrely produced, and it was the brainchild of Roland Joffe, the director of The Killing Fields and The Mission. Why was he doing a teen sex comedy? I still have no idea. So my, my friend calls me up and says, this is, the worst thing I've ever seen in my life, but if it goes, I can get your stuff to Roland Joffe's people. So then about six months later, he calls me up and says, I, I have no idea why, but MTV has picked up this show. Uh, send me something you have in, in TV. And I go, well, 
I've got a Deep Space Nine spec and that's all I have. So I sent them in this Deep Space Nine spec for a teen sex comedy on MTV. And uh, this was my, my first miracle in Hollywood. Um, the guy at Roland Joffe's company, Reddit, was a huge Deep Space Nine fan. So he read it and really liked it. And based on that, I got hired on this show. And the, and the interesting thing, I was working as an English as a second language teacher at the time in a small private Japanese school in the Valley here in Los Angeles. Um, and, and I had been there nearly seven years at that point. Uh, while I was trying to break in. And um, it, it, they only hired me on undress for three weeks at a time. They hired me for three weeks. So I took a three week leave of absence and then they hired me for another three weeks. And, and they did this like several times. So I had to keep putting in a leave of absence at my, my uh, day job. And finally they hired me full time. So I, I ended up, that was my four way, foray into TV. And I ended up there for four seasons, which uh, for MTV's undress, it's like dog years. It was like 18 months, maybe 19 months. We just churn these things out nonstop. So while I was there, I had an agent, um, kind of sort of had an agent that I had gotten. I, I was a finalist in the Nicole Fellowship one year. And I got an agent from that, but uh, she's a lovely person, but kind of end of her career, the only uh, literary agent at an actor's agency. And um, so I, I, but I thought I have a job with MTV. I kind of sort of have an agent. Now would be the time to try to level up and get my next job or my next uh, manager or agent. So here's where the NYPD Blue and Buffy comes into it because um, I thought I should write another spec and get it out there and you know keep my traction going so I decided to write the Buffy the Vampire Slayer spec um, which uh, <laughs> this is this is also it's, it's kind of a tale uh, for rejection because uh, again I had a hard time getting anybody to read it a friend of mine uh, Izzy Weiss she wrote Blue Crush and and we had become friends when we were both on undress she had a great agent at at united talent agency and, and i so we're having technical difficulties no. <laughs> All right, to be continued. <laughs> All right, sorry about that. Um, you might have had another uh, outage at his house. <laughs> You're responsible, Rick. You're responsible. Go to his house, fix his power. This is all you, Rick. <laughs> Hi, Sophie. Uh, Hi. And hey, Adam. Did you have an update? Hold on, guys, sorry. Adam? Uh, not yet. I'm going to touch base right now. Okay. Sounds good. It's crazy. Whenever there's technical difficult te technical difficulties, I'm like, is it them or is it me? I'm looking at my computer like, did something happen yeah. with me or is it them? Yeah. <laughs> like, did they just freeze for me? Them. <laughs> right? Yeah. Everybody's faces and all, everyone's like, is that me or you? <laughs> like, you could tell. Yeah. So how's everyone else doing? Everyone getting their good writing done? Jacob. This is Elena. Sorry, I just used to work with Jacob. <laughs> Jacob <laughs> He's Patrick? Like, yeah, I'm DD on set. <laughs> <laughs> how's it going, Jacob? Going pretty great. Um, yeah. How are you guys doing? Good. I'm eating barbecue. Yeah, not too bad. Oh man, I'm jealous. I love barbecue. Who's what eating kind barbecue? Of, what kind of barbecue, Good. Elena? I'm oh. eating a brisket and it's really <gasps> smoky and delicious. Oh my god. I'm very unhappy we don't have oh, video. Man. I feel betrayed. And I've got, <laughs> now, and I have sausage. Yeah. It's so good. Thank god we don't have video of that. I'll smoke 
Oh my God. There is an attachment <laughs> option on the chat. We must see a picture of this. <laughs> just picture it. Yeah. I'm not as good of a writer as you guys, so I'm not. I'm just in the mi middle of enjoying it. I can't really describe it. I'm just picturing the barbecue that I see on like Food Network. Yeah, it's really fucking good. Just describe it as indescribable. That's what I always do. Yeah, it feels like <laughs> it came right off of a smoke, like a, out of a smoker with like cedar in it or something. It's oh. very, very smoky. Oh, oh, man. Oh, oh, oh damn. <laughs> it's really thick, it. too. Oh, God. Ah, yeah. mm. oh, with all the spices and low and yeah. slow. Yep, yep. And how are you doing, Michael Stewart? Have I met you before? Uh, I'm very well, thank you. Uh, I have not met anybody here before, so oh, well, thank welcome. you all for. Hello, Michael. Um, sorry. Michael, are you on Twitter? No. I am. Okay. Yeah. We'll yeah, say yeah, hi that's to how I, Yeah, that's how I I got this. Um, okay. somebody tweeted. Some I follow Stephen on Twitter, so okay. um, somebody. Are you a writer me. or just a fan of of Stephen's? Uh, or both. Uh, oh, okay. more of the latter, I guess now, but um, yeah. certainly, yeah. So thank you very much for for putting this together. What's your Twitter name? No problem. Uh, it's <laughs> it's it's kind of anonymous right now because it's it's I I I joined Twitter like ten years ago, back before anybody really knew what it was. So it's kind of had like a weird journey. So I I don't really do a lot of like I don't really do like a lot of networking or anything like that. Yeah. So it's I. But uh, nope. Thank you. Yeah, well, welcome. but yeah, if, but if anybody, I'll, I'll meet myself first. But if anybody puts their Twitter handle in the in the chat, I'll definitely follow because I, I definitely want to start start that. So thank you very much. Yeah, no problem. Welcome, and uh, Adam got to fly. It's a problem with being outside. Mm -hmm. uh, anyway, so uh, the uh, Adam said that he's rebooting his computer, so he should be on shortly. <clears throat> and who else have we? Um, Sam, how are you? I mean, I'm not having barbecue right now, so I'm not doing as well as some people are. Oh, I'm doing good. Elena, you oh, must I'm post good. a photo on Twitter of the barbecue. <laughs> like, you must. You must I know. It. It's just mean of her to describe it. <laughs> well, at least she hasn't okay. shown me because then we'd be even more in trouble. Um, well, welcome. Glad you made it. Thank you. Sydney? Fellow veteran. Hello, hello. I'm calling from the Jim Henson studio lot. I'm actually um, in a week long residency for a MFA program out of Stevens College, Missouri. So I will have to check out at 6 p.m., but oh. I couldn't miss this. Okay. Glad you could make oh, it. Glad you made it. Oh, that's, you. that's awesome, though. Yeah. Jim Henson. Yeah. Yes, it's so nice to see everyone I follow on Twitter in real life. Deirdre, yeah. Sophie. Sam, hey guys. <laughs> you know, I've, I've driven past the uh, Jim Henson studio like a thousand times and it, you know, you see the gates, you can't really see inside, so you don't really know what's going on in there, but that's, that's pretty cool. That's awesome. Thanks. <laughs> Sam and Joe, I tweeted a picture of it if, you, if you're so inclined. <laughs> I tagged you. Okay. okay. Uh, JR, how are you? Q Curry? Yeah. Hey. Uh, I don't know if you've met before either. Um, no. I think. Um, I think I saw your uh, tweet from somebody else, and then I followed that, and then and then yeah, I think we had a brief email uh, yeah, discussion. Probably. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I appreciate you coming. Yeah, um, for sure. Hopefully, you'll get on soon. <laughs> yeah. No worries. Um, but you know, it's good. Always good to to see people. Mm -hmm. uh, Dang, Baruch, people it's been good. a while. Hi everyone. Um, oh Joe God. and Sophie, I met you guys earlier this year, I think, for one of the chats. Yeah. But yeah, I'm doing was well. It during so the Jeff Howard. Uh, yeah, during the Jeff Howard yeah, one, yeah. yeah. And we was up until five thirty. Yeah, so, it was. Yeah, it was yeah. fun. <laughs> oh my God, Elena, that photo. <laughs> like to torture you oh jesus it's worse that you showed us the picture yeah oh i didn't look at it yet 
And I got it delivered. Wait, oh no! Cover the camera. No. <laughs> we asked for it. You could get ev- you could get everything know. delivered now. Uh, and Sophie's doing well, Mr. Mrs. Andrews, Miss Andrews. Uh, Ms. Andrews, if you please. Ms. Oh, yeah. Oh, I had a I had hell a of sudden, a week. Are you kidding? I had a sudden vision of a, what was that musical um, with Andrews? Not Mary Poppins, but the other one that she did. Oh, Sound what? of Music? Sound of Music, yeah. I had a, I suddenly saw you in a dress dancing in sunflowers. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm wearing a skirt. Does that count? Yep. <laughs> and it is fun. It does turn. But I just watched that movie for the first time. And I thought it was good. Oh, I, liked it. I, I still haven't seen it. I heard something about Nazis in it. Yeah. And singing. I don't really know. Well, I think they, yeah, I think they're trying to escape. Oh, yeah. The, don't, the, oh, no. I keep thinking Swiss Family Robinson. Never mind. Don't ask me about that movie. Oh, okay. I won't ask you. <laughs> no, but you're, clue about but you're doing well. <laughs> but you're having a good Oh, week. yeah. Hmm? Are you having a good week? Oh, yeah. I got my name this week. Oh, yeah. I I'm, saw. I'm legally I... me now. So now you all know my name. Thank you. So, yeah, no one except a, a few people knew my last name was going to be Andrews. So it was fun to finally tweet that. But, yeah, oh, it was. It was yeah, oh, is like that not your. Time. Sorry, that wasn't your original last name? Oh no! I got rid of oh. that net name totally. Completely. Oh, okay, I didn't. I didn't know that. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's no. Yeah, we don't speak of that anymore. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but oh god, yeah. The twenty minutes before my computer decided to uh, update, and I was cussing it out so bad. And then I realized, okay, let me try on my phone, and it worked. So I made it just like just in time. And I was the first person they let in. They were like, who are you? I'm like, oh, I'm sorry. I put my new name in there. Yeah. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> you know, just. Oh, well, congrats. Thank you. Congrats, Sophie. Hey, uh, you. hey Rick. Yes. Hey, uh, so how, Um, I, because I'm new to this, uh, how often do you guys uh, have Q&As and whatnot? Or is this kind of a um, regular basis? Or is this kind of like special? I've been doing like one a month, but I got a one few a set up for every two weeks now. So I might okay. be putting myself in a bad place. <laughs> but um, I got a Gloria, what? I can't remember what her last name is. Uh, Alderon Kelly? Yeah, I got her in, on the, for the 25th. Um, and then I got John Rogers uh, two weeks after that. Um, my friend is, uh, Bill is Terry Rossia's writing partner and they just sold something to Amazon. So I got them coming on hopefully in September or October. I love Terry Rossio. I love yeah, his I'm writing. I'm excited about that. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, so, and it's his writing partner, yeah? Yeah, yeah. I'm, oh, yeah I've never met Terry, great. but I'm good friends with yeah. Bill. So they also wrote a Deja Vu together. Um, right, right, right. Um, yeah, because so he's got the um, that website that he uses, right? Um, there's just like all this useful crap on it, if I can find it. But it's it's Terry Rossio's website, and he just talks okay. about the industry and like. Yeah, I it's never. Great. I didn't know. I've, I've yeah, yeah. So hopefully you can make it for his. Um, Bill told me to text him. Yeah, wordplayer.com. I got to text him next week. Um, so hopefully post, that happens. Post this in the chat because this is like super useful. If anybody wants wants that, that's Terry Rossio's website, and it's just oh, full of just great advice and just he's got scripts and stuff up there it's yeah so i'm excited for him um and then i got a a uh, assistance panel that i'm putting together so adam is going to join us um gloria's assistant uh old assistant she just uh last week was her last week so she's going to join us um john rogers is assistant might join us and then looking for one more so I'm going to do that too, just because it's, you know, a lot of people don't know how to, you know, break. That's one of the, e- not easy ways, but a, one of the good ways to break into the industry is through being an assistant. So I thought that might help people that might be interested in that path. Um, yes, I, I would be interested in that. <laughs> okay, good. Yeah. Well, you're on the <laughs> list, so just, uh, um, 
Yeah, I just happened to stumble on one of my Facebook groups. I just saw the post for it. And I love Spartacus. And I just wanted to one time just say, kill them all. So I was like, yes. <laughs> well, I'm, glad you, I'm glad you're here. I'm glad to be here. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. And Deidre, how are you doing? Uh, it's Deirdre. Deidre. Oh, Deirdre. 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 Deirdre? <laughs> yes. Right. Okay, Deirdre, how are you? I, I, I'm okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm yeah. glad you're here. J just dealing with that old pandemic anxiety. Yeah. A lot of us are, I think. <laughs> it's really messing with the ability to write, though. Yeah. Yeah, I feel like I have to go at least to the park or something. I can't write at home for some reason. So I nobody, have nobody wears masks here, so I don't go anywhere. Yeah. Where are you at? Um, in Saskatchewan, Canada. Okay. It's the province with the four straight sides. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Yeah. Sometimes you have to drive a little bit further out to get a, to get away from the, you know, from the people. Yeah. Well, I'm at, like said, so, uh, right outside of Philadelphia, and they don't wear masks here either. And when I go out, I, I always have a mask, and people look at me like I'm crazy. Yeah. Same. Yeah, uh, Jamie, we're outside of Philadelphia. I'm also outside of Philly. I'm in uh, Norristown. Oh, nice, nice, it's nice. Right next to um, King of Prussia. Yeah. So, where are you? I'm uh, in Huntington Valley. Like, oh, I've been to okay. Valley. You're a little further, further, further out, but yes, I know where that is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, who else have we met? Sarah, can you hear us? Hi, it's good seeing you. No, we can't hear you though. <laughs> oh. Yeah, oh. weird. But I hope you're doing better. I know life's been a little bit hard. <laughs> Thinking about you though. Uh, Brian. Edwards, can you hear us? Hey, Brian. Uh, you're, you're, uh, okay. So is everyone getting good writing done? No? I'm trying to. Yeah. <laughs> I'm venturing into you... sci-fi and it's a bit more Man, it's just a lot more to think about than just straight drama. I, I, it's like fantasy sci-fi. It's a TV pilot that I'm trying to, my original TV pilot. And man, hats off to fantasy sci-fi writers. <laughs> oh, amen. One, one of the Jeez. best things I saw, and I don't remember who wrote it, but they said the best way to do John, John I think it was a, uh, the guy who handles Illuminati, but he said the best way to do John genre is to write the human story without the genre and then insert the genre in it. So like, don't worry too much about the genre. Don't worry okay. too much about the world building. Put the human story in first and then add the, the you know, monsters or fantasy or sci-fi or whatever it is. Um, like I was comedy, like, oh, right? yeah. I like that. That's you a better it, way to write it. it. Yeah, you know, that's you write it's the drama it's, and then you insert the jokes, you know. Yeah, yeah so I, I, the way I it's said it was, is yeah. genre is drama interrupted is the way I, I love it. that. I love that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. nice. Oh, I that's think that was good. Cargill. I think that's Cargill. That sounds like something that Cargill's the man. We should get Cargill on here. I bet you do <laughs> right? it. Who who's that? Cargill. Robert C. Cargill. Car yeah, he's Robert great, Cargill. Charles yeah. or Car oh, I can't remember his something. first name now. Yeah, he just goes by Cargill. This is his last yeah. name. But, but he's got a he's got a couple podcasts and, and okay. he's he's mm -hmm. super active on Twitter oh, too. Oh, that's awesome. He's yeah, great. he's very active. Is he a, so is he a novelist or a screenwriter? No, no, he's oh, a screenwriter. He's, he's both. He writes novels he, too, actually. Didn't he write yeah. Doctor Strange? Really? Yeah, he wrote Doctor Strange yeah. with he does a lot, he, does he a works lot of with the, Scott Derrickson a lot. Derrickson, yeah, yeah that's yeah. the guy. Yeah, they wrote uh, Sinister, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. so they did. <clears throat> So send me an email with his name and I'll put him on, on the list. I'll do it. I'll do it. 
Oh, I'm going to do How do you not she's know got, Cargo? She's got, I know. <laughs> I know. That's amazing. Yeah. He He's got a couple mission. podcasts too. Yeah. Okay. That's great. I should listen to him as well so I can improve <laughs> my own podcast. <laughs> junk food. Yeah. The junk food. And then there's also like a writer one that he had, but it's like, I forget what it's called. Something writers. I don't know. Yeah. But yeah, that junk food one that Michael put on, that junk food one is like, he, they talk about like their favorite movies and they just like, bullshit about them and talk about the best things about them but coming from a the, the standpoint of screenwriting and yeah. like movie watching in, in general so cool uh, like steven's back. back for real um still connected <laughs> hey that's good there to have you succeed in hollywood hey how are you? Hey, there you Welcome back. Welcome back. Hey, sorry about that. Uh, Spectrum uh, internet is screwing me today. Um, so right. where, where did you lose me? Buffy the Vampire Slayer. <laughs> I was looking forward to that one. <laughs> so, uh, so I write this uh, spec Buffy the Vampire Slayer, and that one was about why men can't be the Vampire Slayer basically because we're too aggressive and it goes to our fat heads and we become just uh, insane with power. Um, so I write this spec Buffy the Vampire Slayer script and I, I give it to my good friend Lizzie Weiss to give to her agent at UTA. And uh, she gets back to me about two weeks later and says, ah, they liked it, they didn't love it and uh, they're gonna pass on repping you. And I go, well, that sucks. So I gave it to my agent who only knew three people in television. And one of them <laughs> just so happens to have been the head of Joss Whedon's company at Mutant Enemy. So she, uh, she sends it over to him. He likes it, he calls me in and wants to talk to me about working on the animated show that they were developing at the time. And, and my first reaction was, uh, you know, anything. <laughs> I'll take anything uh, uh, from uh, MTV's Undressed at that point. And uh, he said, but Joss has to read the script first. So they send it to Joss and I wait for about a month. And then I get a call uh, from my agent saying, Joss wants to meet you. Can you go over to uh, uh, Bergamot Station in Santa Monica? Anybody in LA that knows uh, uh, Santa Monica, Bergamot Station used to be a, this train depot in Santa Monica that then became this art collective. And unbeknownst to most people, that's where they shot Buffy the Vampire Slayer. There was a little hidden section that was a Fox building in a little back lot right there off the freeway. So I go over and I meet with Joss and we talk about comic books and movies for about a half an hour. And at the end, he says, uh, look, I know you're talking about the animated show, but do you want to come write an episode of the live action show? And I said, fuck, yes, I do. Are you kidding me? So I, uh, I, I literally wrapped up my job on undress and, and about a week later, I got the call to come in and, and do my episode of, uh, the live action show. Um, and that went really well. And based on that, uh, Joss Whedon and Marty Knox invited me to come on full time. This was halfway through season five. And I always say that was the real start of my career. As I undressed, I was able to dip a toe in. And I think it helped that I had been on anything at that point. Uh, and uh, that's, that's really how I got into TV. Uh, I kind of fell backwards into it with a uh, Deep Space Nine spec and uh, stayed in it with a Buffy the Vampire Slayer spec. So that's I, oh, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting because what I've been told is that right now it's easier to get into features than TV. And uh, during, yeah. You know, all advice take with a grain of salt, even my own. Uh, because it comes from different people's perspectives. Um, being in the business right now, my, my agents and other producers that I work with all tell me the same thing. It's like, ah, oh, it's a lousy time to be in the movie business right now. 
it's just so tough. And, uh, you know, from where I, when I started in the business, studios were still making 20 and $30 million movies and releasing them. They really don't do that anymore. Uh, they've gotten squeezed out. They're either making, you know, micro budget uh, horror or action movies in the uh, $8 million range, five to $8 million range, or they're making gigantic tent poles in the 100 to 200 million range. And that uh, those kind of movies that I grew up loving, those kind of, you know, uh, adult oriented movies, you know, things like the conversation, you know, uh, try making that today. Uh, really, really tough. Um, but I mean, it, it certainly, you certainly can make a living in the movies and a lot of people do, a lot of my friends do. It's not easy. Uh, and also time-wise, it takes forever. It's really like watching paint dry, uh, do, doing a movie. Um, I've got a couple of movie projects right now and on, on most of them, we're like in year two, we still don't have a script because it's taken this long to get this far. And, uh, you know, once we have a script, best case, fastest it would be is like 18 months before we could shoot it. It's usually more like two years. And depending on the size of the movie, like when I did Pacific Rim Uprising, that movie took two years to make. And that was really, really, really crazy fast for a movie like that. And usually those movies take three years to make. Um, so, yeah, look, you can absolutely... Uh, uh, break into the movie business and have a great career there. Is it easier to break in than TV? I, I'm not really sure it is. Because here's the thing about TV is uh, there's so much more opportunity now than when I started. When I first started, um, none of the cable outlets were doing original programming. Um, HBO was doing original programming, but that was about it for the premium channels. And really, you know, we had uh, Fox, NBC, ABC, CBS, and the CW that was on four nights a week when I first started. So it was, it was a little harder just purely because there were less shows on TV. Now there are so many shows with these streaming services. Actually, as a showrunner, it's very, very, very hard to put a staff together because there are so many shows competing for so many people. The downside to that, though, is when I started out, if you got on a TV show, you were doing 22 episodes a year. So you would work 11 months out of the year, um, usually have three or four weeks off, and then you would start right back in on the next season. It was a constant, constant churn. Uh, but you knew you had a job. Like if you got hired on a show for three years and the show wasn't canceled, you knew you were on that show for three years, 11 months out of the year. Um, nowadays, a lot of these streamers only have, you know, eight episode orders, which means that it's uh, one as a showrunner, it's almost impossible to keep your staff together because with, with an eight episode order, you generally work about four months uh, out of the year on an eight episode order. And it's not enough to actually make a good living on. So writers have to immediately, while they're finishing one show, they've got to line up their next show. So when it comes, when your show is, uh, you know, picked up or goes in the, the next season, most of your writers are gone because they had to go take another job. It's also very, very, very stressful for writers coming up through the ranks because you always have to be looking for the next job now instead of concentrating on the job you're on. And it's also um, very, very difficult for uh, people moving up the ranks. It's very, very difficult for a writer's assistant to, uh, you know, get in, be able to write an episode of the show because there just aren't enough episodes anymore. For example, for an, an eight episode show, uh, when I did the ill-fated Jupiter's Legacy, we had eight episodes um, I wrote the pilot and the finale, and I had uh, six, six writers. So, I mean, you can do the math. Uh, I wrote two of the episodes. Each of the other writers got one episode, and there were no episodes left to, you know, hand out. 
even on Spartacus, when we were doing 10 and 13 episodes, I was able to, uh, you, you know, have um, my writer's assistant and my script coordinator. Uh, they wrote a script together one season. My assistant, Allison Miller, uh, got to write a script. And based on that, she got hired on the next season. But at, at eight episodes, it's almost impossible to give people those chances. So that's, that's the downside. But the plus side is there are so many goddamn shows out there now that it's a constant scramble for writers to fill those positions. So if you've got, you know, strong writing samples and just, you know, you can get in there with a connection or two, you've got a very, very, very strong chance of being able to get a toe in. A question about that. Uh, so do, do you see, uh, do you see it ever reverting back to kind of like a 22 episode season? Um, because there is that kind of like insatiable appetite for content out there. Are they just moving on to the next thing immediately? Or are they like, hey, we actually might need more episodes. Than this. I know it's been 10 or eight to 10 episodes for the past like, you know, five to 10 years, but. Yeah, I don't think it will ever go back to 22. Um, but also if you, you know, I'm, I'm waxing nostalgic about 22. If you go back further than that, if you go back to, you know, the fifties, the sixties, they were doing 33, 35 episodes a season. They were cranking them out. And, um, you know, you also, you tend to see the less episodes you do per season, the higher the quality. Uh, because even when I was doing 22 episodes a season, we always came in knowing that, um, you know, look, out of these 22, maybe six to eight will be great. And then there'll be, you know, a handful that are, eh, they're okay. And uh, then there'll be at least five or seven that just stink because you ran out of time. You just didn't have any time. You know, you, you just had to shoot something. Um, I think also with today's audience, uh, and, and I hear this a lot because I've had this discussion on Twitter. Today's audience, I, I hear a lot of, ah, I don't want to go back to 22 episodes. That's too many. Um, I, my personal feeling is uh, as a showrunner, I, I would love the money of 22 a season, but that's, it consumes your entire life. Uh, I do think eight is not enough. But to me, eight is, you don't have enough elbow room to really explore a story. And I use Daredevil as a great example. If we had only had eight episodes of Daredevil, and Netflix was constantly pushing for less episodes uh, because of their algorithm and, and their algorithm tells them eight is the perfect number. Um, but if we had only done eight episodes in that first season, anybody that's seen Daredevil you wouldn't have gotten Fisk's backstory, for example. Uh, you wouldn't have gotten any of those kind of moments. You wouldn't have seen uh, Matt and Foggy back when they were in college. Um, no room for any of that. And, and I think that's a great tragedy, especially if you look at a show going back in history like the X-Files. Some of the best X-Files were like those crazy Darren Morgan episodes that just had nothing to do with anything, but they're fantastic. All of those would have been swept away and you would have just had to stay on plot, 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 uh, which I think is tragic. I'm hoping things balance out um, because I've done, I've done 22, I've done six, eight, 10 and 13. And for me, uh, I think the sweet spot is 13. Uh, you don't have that incredible pressure to get, just keep churning out shit to feed the machine, but you have enough room so you can take a couple of episodes and, and just, you know, hook a left turn and explore something that's interesting and, and cool. Because I, I, thinking about Daredevil, if you didn't know Fist's backstory, I think it would have severely damaged the entire season. Um, so 22, I don't see it in the cards for that to be the standard anymore, but I'm hoping uh, 13. And this also ties into a thing about dropping an entire season of TV all at once. 
which uh, uh, look, uh, maybe I'm getting old and I just, I just don't care for that, but I don't care for it from a creative reason is that if you look at the shows that have really hit the zeitgeist recently, like the Marvel shows, Ted Lasso, uh, Mayor of East Town, these are shows that drop one episode a week. And what that allows to do, it allows for the audience to get excited about it, to talk about it, to speculate about it um, in a way that you can't get when you drop all the episodes at the same time because nobody's in the same place. Uh, but you just look at Loki, where everybody was talking after every episode each week, you know, the Internet was just you know, on fire with people talking about Loki, speculating about Loki. And if you drop them all at the same time, you just don't get that. And it's, it's very interesting to me that, you know, Netflix started dropping everything at the same time. And then Disney Plus and Amazon came in and basically said, oh, fuck that. No, we're not doing that. We're going to drop it weekly. And the weekly stuff just gets more traction. Now, I understand why Netflix does it. They have so much content. That's really not something they can do. But extremely smart for Disney Plus and Amazon to go against that and, and Apple TV as well and drop them weekly. Because I, I don't think, uh, you, you know, I, I think about Lost. If you dropped an entire season of Lost at the same time, the show would not have been as big as it is. Because you, you want those, you want to be talking about it around the, you know, the virtual water cool. Uh, you, you want your audience to be excited about it and just to be thinking about what's going to come next, which you, you absolutely cannot get when you drop an entire season at the same time. And that's why I think when you drop an entire season at the same time, people do talk about it, but it's a much smaller window because then the next thing comes out. The other problem uh, with dropping all episodes at the same time is let's say I do 10 episodes of a show. I drop all episodes on June 1st uh, of this year. Um, now I'm in a bit of a quandary because it's going to be at least an entire 12 months before you get a new episode. And oftentimes, uh, like in the Netflix model, it could be 18 months, two years, two and a half years, sometimes three years before you see the next season. And I think if you wait that long, you're just going to lose your audience, whether they love the show or not. Like, I love Stranger Things. But, uh, you know, when I heard, oh, it's going to be coming out next year, I'm like, when's the last time I watched an episode of that? Was that like three years ago? It's like, what, are the kids going to be in college now? <laughs> it's like... Yeah, that happened a lot with that show Dark on Netflix. Yeah. Yeah, like, it's about time travel. So, it, like, you're going a year after it's dropped that season, and you're like, holy crap, I gotta, I have to watch that whole season again yeah. just to understand what the hell's going on. Anyway. And that's, that's one of the problems. If, if you do a show like that, um, a lot of times uh, some studios and some streamers, they don't want a green light season two until season one comes out and they see how it does, which is completely understandable. But if you have a show that's even vaguely complicated, that's more than just two people in a room talking, you can't go from zero to releasing a show within one year and retain the quality. Um, and that's the thing, like when, when I was doing 22 episodes a year, we would generally start the next season while the previous season was still in post and episodes were still coming out weekly, uh, there was always, there was this constant overlap. And, uh, I, and I know I've tried with streamers before when I was working on shows, uh, you know, when everything was wrapped up to say, Hey, you know, why don't you just green light the writer's room? You know, you're not spending a gazillion dollars in cash, but if the show's a hit, we'll be ready to go. Instead of now we've got to add like, uh, you know, it takes usually it takes minimum like two months to staff a show and work out everybody's contract, get an office. Then it's another four, four and a half months to get the scripts done. So we've already eaten like six, seven months. And, uh, you know, that's uh, to me, 
that's one of the thing I, I love about what I see Amazon and Apple doing is that by God, they have a hit show. If that, if you watch in a season on June 1st, you can guarantee by the next June 1st, you're going to see another season, if not sooner, which I think you, you absolutely have to do to keep the audience attention. There is so much content and it is so overwhelming. And I've got a bunch of shows that I've heard are great that are lined up for me to watch. And I, just haven't had the time. And, you know, after a while, you're like, eh, uh, you know, I, I'll just never watch it. Why does Netflix take so long to uh, release their seasons? And, and uh, aren't there, are there some shows that they could release episode by episode or they, they just refuse to, to do that? I, uh, you know, I, I honestly don't know. And look, I, I, I'm not, bashing netflix um you know i've had my issues with netflix i've had good times i've had bad times uh it's funny i know a producer who had problems on a on one of her shows with netflix and she canceled netflix because she didn't want to give them any money i i've obviously had my problems with netflix but i'm not canceling netflix i mean (laughs) there are things i want to watch on netflix um but from what I saw from the inside, it's uh, it's very much that thing wanting to see how the season plays before you give it another season. Um, and, and that just by the nature of the game means pretty much the fastest you can turn that around is 18 months. Yeah. That's pretty quick from zero to finished product. Uh, assuming there's not a massive amount of visual effects. If there's a massive, massive amount of visual effects, it's going to be two years between seasons uh, trying to do it that way. Um, so it, it's really, and look, I also understand that nobody has the amount of content that Netflix does. They have an overwhelming amount of content uh, and they're also now producing their own content. So it's a, it's a little bit of a different thing for them. Yeah because they have so much content that um, it kind of doesn't matter ultimately if a show comes out every year or comes out every two years. You know, while you're waiting, here's another thousand shows for you to watch. So, uh, but a- as a creator, it's, it's difficult to keep your enthusiasm up when you have that long of a break. Uh, and again, I might just be a little bit old fashioned that way. Cause you know, I, I, I came up through a system where by God, every season you start at the same time when I did Spartacus for stars, um, every January, we had a new season, hell or high water. Um, because, uh, uh, we all felt, that we didn't want to lose the audience by waiting too long. And also we just didn't want to lose the, uh, you know, the creative flow. Um, Because it's, it's always really, really hard and jarring going back to something that you haven't been working on for quite a while. And and it usually takes a bit to get going again. Well, as a viewer, there are shows that I've stopped watching because, you know, two years and then I don't really want to go back and watch the whole first season again. Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, it, it, it's definitely a conundrum. Um, yeah, my preference is to have the show on, you know, pick a month and by God, every month have that come on. And of course, I, I, you know, I, I grew up where uh, new shows and returning shows, you know, started in the fall, you know, the fall TV guide preview was huge when I was growing up and then they played until right before summer. And then you had three months of reruns. Yeah. Uh, That obviously is no longer the case. Now there's content 24 seven, the entire year, which again is better for writers. Um, You know, the whole pitching season, staffing season that we used to go through, um, you know, the, the horrible uh, April, May, staffing season where you chewed your nails to see if you would have a job and if not you pretty much had to wait until the next year that's gone it's staffing 12 months out of the year now and it's development 12 months out of the year uh which that i think is a really positive 
impact the streamers have had on the business is, is right. that now it's just constant development and staffing. So a lot of the writers here have, you know, are still trying to, you know, like me, trying to get that break. Um, so how, how do, uh, you know, since there is so much opportunity, how do you uh, think that, you know, some of the writers should, that are watching or attending this should go about getting their, you know, trying to get on, at least on the radar? Yeah, you, you know, ask 10 working writers that question, you'll get 10 different answers. Uh, there is no right answer. Um, usually it's just the answers of, they can tell you how they got there. Uh, like I told you how I managed to fall into a career in TV and movies. Um, you know, there's multiple ways that I was, I mean, I got my first agent because I was a finalist in the Nicole Fellowship Contest. Um, and I'm sure a lot of you uh, do the contest route and it's brutal. Uh, you know, I, for like seven years, I was submitting stuff to contests. And for seven years, I got rejection after rejection after rejection. And as much as being a finalist in the Nicole Fellowship helped, uh, you know, I was one of the final five one year. Uh, which was great, except losing when you're in the final five, it's not a good feeling when you're that close and you still can't get it done. Yeah. Um, so, so you can't give up. I, I, I still highly recommend the contest route. Um, if you can place in, in you know, the, the top five or the top 10, there's a very good chance you can parlay that into rep. Um, we didn't have the, the blacklist when I was coming up, yeah. uh, you know, getting some buzz there. And, and I, I subscribe to the blacklist and I take a look at it every week. And every now and then I, I will request a couple of scripts to read to possibly come on as an executive producer. I haven't found anything that's been quite right yet, but it can certainly happen. Um, and the old adage, you know, it's, it's who, who you know, certainly helps. And look, I grew up in South Jersey. I didn't know anybody in Hollywood. Um, the only person I knew was a guy I went to college with who, you know, landed as a production coordinator on a iffy teen sex comedy. So it's, uh, uh, but, you know, the relationships you make with people, the relationships you're making right now with each other is also really, really important because you never know when somebody you're friends with or a colleague is going to get their foot in the door. And I always believe about, you know, dropping that rope down to the next person and, and helping people yeah. up, up the chain. Um, there's also uh, very different from when I started. Uh, technology obviously wasn't as, as slick and prevalent as it is now. And, uh, you know, people get their start by shooting shorts. Uh, I mean, Jesus, the, the, the director from uh, Shazam started out by just a little tiny short horror thing that, you know, got bought and developed into a movie and that went well. And then he's doing Shazam. Yeah. Uh, so uh, there's so many opportunities now to really make content and, and get your foot in the door, but it's never easy. It's always uh, a bit of a, a lottery and it's always a lot of sweat and perseverance and just blind luck. I mean, I felt, I feel like I, I worked a hell of a lot to get a break. Um, and then something lucky happened and I was prepared to take advantage of it. Yeah. And that's very important when, uh, when that lightning strikes, uh, you don't want to say, uh, give me three months to get <laughs> a, a spec script. Uh, yeah. you know, that'll murder you. Um, and talking about the spec script thing, you know, you want to have multiple samples, in my opinion. Yeah. Uh, you know, this is something that shows a variety and something that, you know, if, if you're talking to somebody, oh, you know, I'm, I'm doing a comedy. Well, send over your stuff, uh, you know, to have that, that spec script uh right there waiting um they always say you need at least two okay. uh if not more um and and uh, you know uh the prevailing wisdom 
has been for quite some time, uh, you know, that people want to see original spec scripts. Um, but it's kind of blowing the other way now is people also, I always like to see an original script and a, uh, a spec script of an existing show. And what the spec script of the existing show tells a showrunner is that you can emulate somebody else's style, which is very, 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 very important. If somebody had written a spec Spartacus that was even close, I would have hired him on the spot. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, with Buffy, I got hired off of spec Buffy. And uh, my buddy, Drew Greenberg, he got hired off of Spec Buffy. Um, uh, and again, with that show, the voice was so specific that when Joss uh, read a script that was even close to that voice, it was like, oh, yes, please come in. Uh, you know, you, you've got the voice. Uh, the rest can be taught. Do you think that's acquired or do you think you have to practice that? Uh, it, it, emulating somebody else's voice? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Look, practice always helps. I, I think, uh, you know, uh, us all being writers, you know, we're often writing about other people's point of view and perspective that's not necessarily our own. Um, so it's, it's kind of part and parcel with our trade. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, I, I also always highly recommend uh, if you're going to write a spec, don't write it purely because you, you think, oh, well, this will be kind of a good sample. Uh, you have to be madly passionate about it. Uh, like, like when I wrote the spec Buffy, I was very passionate about the story. I was very excited about the story. And the same thing about the Deep Space Nine spec. I was very excited about the story. I enjoyed writing it. I wanted to write it. Uh, you don't want it to feel like homework. You really, uh, you know, it's like that old adage that I, I, I always hated <laughs> about write what you know. And I, I, you know, when I was told that when I was in college, I was always disagreeing with it. I said, that makes absolutely no fucking sense whatsoever. Uh, you know, that's what research is for. Uh, write, write what you're passionate about. Write what excites you. Um, there'll be plenty of time for you to write things that don't excite you once you're in the business. <laughs> That'll happen a lot. <laughs> it reminds me of when I was doing uh, Smallville and one season, uh, uh, it was uh, the first episode, uh, uh, I think it was season six, my first season there. And I, it was the first one I was going to write and direct that season. And I, I had this story I loved. I was so excited. It was uh, Kryptonite Zombies. It's a uh, Luther Corps truck transporting, you know, the sludge from his kryptonite experiments overturns on a rainy night next to a graveyard and it's kryptonite living dead and they surround the kent farm and clark's powerless against the kryptonite zombies and i was so excited and then i went off to do a rewrite on on some other script and i came back and uh al goff and miles miller who ran the show and i i love those guys they were so good to me i love them to this day but al says hey steve Great news. We got a new story for you. And I'm like, yeah. And I, Clark and Lana find a baby. And I'm like, what the fuck just happened? <laughs> so I went from kryptonite zombies to Clark and Lana found a baby, uh, which to this day I say is one of the worst episodes of Smallville <laughs> ever made in its 10 years uh, uh, run. Uh, but, you know, that's that's my point. Once you're in the business, you're going to have to write a lot of stuff that you really, really do not feel passionate about. Uh, but, but you fake it on the page. You know, you, you've got to give it your all. But when you're writing these specs, just, just make sure it's something you have to write, that you're so excited about it. And that will shine through when people read the script. Well, I, I just have want a question. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Again. I just wanted Finally. to say that everyone can ask a question, so you know. <laughs> okay, go ahead, Joe. Uh, yeah, it's uh, it's about the um, spec scripts because I heard, like, for example, if I wanted to write for Jessica Jones, that I couldn't write a spec about Jessica Jones because I couldn't be hired in that show. Uh, my first question is, who said that? <laughs> uh, you know, I I googled it. 
and it was like all over the place. The internet is the devil's playground. Believe me. <laughs> Uh, I will join on this. I, I also heard that same thing for many years where if you wanted to get on a show, you had to write something that's completely unrelated to that. Like it had to be like yeah. the same genre, but it couldn't be the same show because they would never look at the same show on that show. They People wanted to see something it's similar. Fine. Um, it's not true. It's just simply not true. Um, look, I, when I wrote my spec Buffy the Vampire Slayer, it, it wasn't to get on Buffy. Uh, I never, never, ever dreamed that would happen. Uh, it was just, this was an existing show that I was excited about. And I wanted to show that I could, you know, emulate someone else's voice besides my own. Um, uh, I think it's less and less rare to get hired uh, off a script from an actual show. Um, you know, sometimes there's some legal reasons people are reluctant to look at specs from their own show uh because you know there are so many similar ideas uh but you know that's that's pretty much what agents and managers are for uh to have that buffer so people don't think their idea was stolen i i've also had the stolen idea um conversation so many times where i've had uh, other writers see something and say oh they stole my idea and i have to explain uh, no. <laughs> uh, yeah, if, if you have the most original idea you think you've ever thought of, trust me, 20 other people in Hollywood are working on it right now. It's just the way it works. There's so many people. And I've had that happen to myself. The worst thing is when you spend like a year writing a script and you finish it and then you see a trailer for a movie that's just like it. Uh, it happens all the time. Um, but like I said, I mean, I got hired off of Buffy. My buddy Drew Greenberg got hired off of Buffy. It, it does absolutely happen. And, and I would have no qualm if I had a hit show, like, like, uh, like when I was working on Spartacus, if somebody you know, presented a sample of an original script and a Spartacus script, uh, absolutely would have read it. Now it's also, it's slightly dangerous only because you have to really nail it. Because if, if you write, uh, let's say you're trying to get on um, Ted Lasso and you write a Ted Lasso spec and it's about a 72% there, uh, you will not get hired because it's just proof that you can't write the show. If it's 80%, 85% there, it's proof that you're damn close and you could get hired on the show. So, but again, the most important thing is I recommend, and I do recommend everybody write a spec of an existing show. It's not only good to have it as, as a sample, but it's good exercise to see how you can put yourself in somebody else's shoes. Um, but, uh, but yeah, just, uh, just don't expect to get hired on the show through that. Uh, but it, it, it shouldn't be a, a deterrent at all. Yeah, the uh, the WB program uh, requires spec episodes to be written for for their fellowship, which is great. Um, so if anybody Very wants smart. to think about doing that, yeah, I, I think you know it fell out of favor for a long time, which I can never quite understand. Uh, I yeah, think it, I think nowadays, yeah, people just want to yeah. see pilots. Yeah, which pilots. look honestly, anybody can write a pilot. Uh, and that's the truth. And, you know, uh, Hollywood's lousy with pilots and unmade pilots. I got to stack myself. Um, but if I'm hiring a staff, uh, I will always ask if they have a, a spec of, of an existing show. Uh, and like I said before, it, it's not only good business, it's fantastic exercise for a writer. I'm so glad I did those two specs uh, way back when. And uh, I've even considered now doing a, a, a spec if I had the time, because there are shows that I just love that, uh, you know, I, I know I wouldn't, uh, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm in this weird thing. You know, when you get to a certain level, it's like good and bad because there are so many shows I love, but I'm not a staff writer anymore. So I can't work for those shows. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm too bloated and expensive basically. 
uh, but uh, yeah, yeah, I, I highly, highly, highly recommend writing a spec. So what is your process for, for hiring a room? Uh, torturous and painful. Uh, always. It's always, putting a room together is uh, partly science and part alchemy, quite frankly. Um, because you have to find writers that you believe are really great on the page. And then you interview the writer. And then you have to think about how all the writers fit together. Uh, because personality also, quite frankly, goes a long way. Um, one rotten apple in a writer's room really will spoil the whole bunch. It will completely derail the energy. And I've had that happen before on shows I've, I've run and shows I've been on. Um, you know, people who just uh, don't know how to properly interact with other human beings. Uh, it can be, <laughs> it can really, really, really make things difficult. So first and foremost, it starts with on the page, you know, I always read samples first before I meet with anybody. And then uh, I usually meet with my producing partner, Brooke Worley, um, and my assistant will be in the room as well. Uh, at the moment, that's Adam Bradley. And uh, in the past, it's been other people because I, I also want uh, a couple of other voices in the room afterwards to consult and say, you know, what did you think? What was your vibe? And and there there have been times that I've been swayed to hire somebody that I originally wasn't thinking about. And there have been other times that I've been swayed to not hire somebody that I was thinking about hiring um, based on how the whole group fits together. Uh, but first and foremost, it's on the page. Uh, when you start to staff a show, you know, you reach out to all the agencies. They send you a landslide of submissions, you know, just <laughs> way too many scripts to read. Um, so you've got to look at uh, their, usually their resume, what they've worked on before. Um, once you've been in the business for quite a few years, uh, generally most writers will have worked on a show where you know the showrunner or you know somebody else that worked on that show. So I always reach out to them and say, hey, how is this person? Uh, which is also another very, 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 very important thing for when you break into the business. Realize that this one show you're on, it's much more than one show. Uh, everybody you're working with is a potential reference. So, uh, you know, and I'm not saying, oh, you got to watch what you say or anything like that. It's just, you know, just be a decent human being. I always say the simplest thing to do is not be a dick. And you would be amazed at how many people just can't do that. <laughs> it's just stunning how many people shoot themselves in the foot. And uh, I, 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 I've, I've had quite a few experiences with that in a room where I've had to either let people go during a season or not bring them back for another season. Uh, just because, you know, they just either the writing wasn't up to snuff or just personality wise, they just weren't working out. Um, so, yeah, you put out the call to the agencies and the managers. They all come pouring in. Uh, usually you also get some recommendations from other writers or friends. I know on the first season of uh, Spartacus, uh, there was a recommendation from a friend of mine who, who wasn't a writer. Uh, it was from a stunt person. I recommended this writer who had no credits but I read her work. I really liked it. I met with her and we hired her on the show. Um, and, and now she's actually, she's running a show on Fox now. So those kind of things do happen. Uh, again, it, uh, it, you know, it helps to know somebody, uh, even if they're not, you know, directly in the business that you want to be in. Uh, people talk and people recommend people. And, uh, and included in that hiring a staff, I usually have people that I've also worked with before that I know I can count on and bring in. So those people will always be on my list. 
but because there's so much content out there, usually those people aren't available. Yeah. So it's uh, generally an entirely new staff you have to bring on. Anyone else have, have any questions? Feel free, Sam. Um, from your first time as a staff writer, do you have any practical advice or lessons you learned from your, from your first time? Yes, indeed, I do. <laughs> That's a good question. Um, try to be the first person there and the last person to leave. That's the big one. Like when I got hired on Buffy, by God, I was there before anybody else. And, you know, I was usually the last one to leave. Uh, also because I just loved it so much. It was, it was a college atmosphere. It really was. It was so much fun. Um, uh, be the, uh, be the person that has a solution, not just a problem. I've also been in rooms where there's the naysayer, where all they do is poke holes in things. Um, you know, sometimes you have to say, hey, I'm not, you know, this doesn't quite make sense, but always have something in your pocket where you can say, what if we tried this, you know, and added it to that, and then that makes sense. I remember uh, my first season on Buffy. This was when, uh, if anybody used to watch the show, it's when uh, oh, wow. the villain. So Glory was the villain. And when I was there, um, they hadn't quite figured out what her plan was yet. Uh, because uh, it, it, the plan up till then was she wanted to open up a dimensional portal to return home to her hell dimension. And my question when I came on was, well, isn't that a good thing? She just wants to go home and leave. <laughs> I mean, why would they want to stop that from happening? Uh, so, but I also had a solution. I said, well, what if when she opens up this dimension to go home, she's not just opening up that doorway, she's opening up all doorways between dimensions. So all of this bad shit's going to lead into our world if she does that. And uh, I think that also got me hired on season two because Joss was like, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. That doesn't upset the apple cart. And it totally makes sense. Um, I don't know if I had another good idea that season, but I, I had at least one. And, uh, you know, it's always hard when it's your first time on staff because you don't know how much you should say in the room because you, you don't want to be the person that's talking too much, but you don't want to talk not enough. So you really just got to kind of feel that middle ground and, and don't be afraid to sit back and, and take in how people are interacting and putting their ideas out. Uh, each room's a little bit different. Um, with my rooms, I, I always say uh, when people come in, it doesn't matter if you're an a co-executive producer or you're a staff writer. Um, all ideas carry equal weight with me. Uh, it really doesn't matter. We're all in here to make a good show and have fun. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I've had writer's assistants throw out ideas that we've used. Um, so really, it's just you want to be the type of person that people want to be around, you know? Um, Joss used to say, you could be the best writer in the world, but if you don't get along with the family, I don't want you here. And I feel exactly the same way. Uh, a great writer that ruffles everybody else is useless. Um, I would rather have a writer that's eh, pretty good and uh, really gets along with everybody else and jives with the team. So, uh, yeah, you know, and again, it, that part all fun falls under, don't be a dick. It's that simple. Can, can, can you um, talk about a time early on where you stumbled in the room and you had to learn a lesson the hard way? Um, I don't know if I ever stumbled. I mean, look, I've thrown out a shit ton of bad ideas. Really bad, terrible, awful, embarrassing. <laughs> but the great thing about the rooms that I was in and the thing that I carried on when I became a showrunner is to encourage people to feel free to throw out bad ideas. I mean, uh, even when I'm running a show, I still throw out bad ideas 
And uh, I'm the first one to admit when, oh, that idea sucks, forget that. Um, because you never know when, you know, that crazy half-baked idea will lead you somewhere really, really, really cool. And back in, in Spartacus, <laughs> this, is, this was a good one. Uh, the team was working on, we knew we wanted this uh, gladiator, this invincible gladiator in season one called the Shadow of Death. So we were building up to this big fight with the Shadow of Death and um, a couple of my writers pitched that, uh, you know, there's been a drought in Capua all this time. And I go, well, that's interesting. And, and then they said, and Badiatis gets involved in this aqueduct waterworks to bring water to the city. And I'm like, you lost me. You lost me at uh, public works. <laughs> but that led to what if Spartacus kills the shadow of death and it starts raining? And then he's called the bringer of rain. And that's where that kind of bad idea led us to a really great idea. Um, I, I, I can't think of a time. I, look, I can think of plenty of times when I was higher up that I stumbled. Um, usually <laughs> dealing with the studio or network. Uh, plenty of those. Uh, but, but coming up, um, if anything, I wish I had talked a little bit more early on. Because I, I had a bunch of ideas, but, you know, I was just so timid about bringing them forward. Um, that would probably be the biggest thing. And, and I discovered much later, uh, bizarrely, um, that I was much better in a writer's room if I was running it than I was a, you know, writer in it. Because I, I tend to uh, kind of you know, go off into my own little fantasy world uh, when I'm just sitting there. Um, Does that come from your like directing background on like Angel and, and Smallville or? I'm not sure. Uh, you know, it's weird because uh, the directing is not my main thing. It, it's not second nature to me. Right. But just like maintaining that, like, you know, leadership and like maintaining that room and maintaining like the budget and studio and like all the heads and stuff. Maybe it, it could be. It, it, it's also a, a strange dichotomy. It's like I'm I'm fine with like a small group of people. I'm fine with like a group of talking in front of four thousand people at Comic Con. It's the in between that. <laughs> it's twenty people apparently is a bit of a problem for me. Um, but yeah, the, the biggest thing I, I wish I I talked more and I wish I was more relaxed. And didn't worry so much about how my ideas were perceived early on. And that didn't come from any kind of pressure from the showrunners. It was purely an internal pressure from myself. And, and I, I hope for all of you, if, if you get on a show um, on the TV side, that you have a, a showrunner that really fosters that kind of camaraderie where, you know, th there are no you know, you're not, you're not going to get mocked and, and ridiculed for, for your crazy idea. A good natured ribbing is always fine. Uh, in fact, nobody laughs harder than me when I get ribbed about my own bad ideas. Um, but I, I've also, I, thankfully, I've never experienced this firsthand, but I, I've heard about some really, really, really awful things that showrunners have said in the room. Um, very famous showrunner, which I won't drop names. Uh, somebody delivered a script and they came into the room in front of everybody and said, um, you know, I was going to really tear into you about this script, but you must be embarrassed enough yourself having written it. Which is like how my favorite story is, again, I won't name names, but a, a showrunner uh, called a writer in who had written the script and the you know, the script's bound by brads, those brass uh, attachments. And the showrunner said, this script is so awful. This, this you know, the, the only good thing this could be used for is to wipe my ass with. And the writer said, okay, just make sure you leave the brads in. And then walked out, packed up his, uh, his office and went to his car. And uh, interestingly enough, the showrunner ran after him, apologized, and, and that guy now is like a hugely successful showrunner, uh, writer, director. Um, but thankfully, 
I, I've had a much better experience. Um, uh, Joss, and, and I know, uh, look, I know there's been a lot of things about Joss and the media that I can't really talk to because my, my experience with Joss as an up and coming writer director. So I, I, there's a lot of things that I, I didn't see. Um, but uh, the, the thing with him in his room is he wanted everybody to do well. Uh, sometimes he mocked you a little bit too much, but, you know, um, and then when I went to Smallville, Al Goff and Miles Miller were great. Um, you know, I, I've just had really, really overall very positive experiences with showrunners, but there are horrible, horrible people out there. Um, thankfully, nowadays, they don't I don't think they last very long now because that's just not tolerated anymore. But hopefully, I, I really hope all of you, uh, if you wind up on a TV show, you have, you know, showrunners that are, are fun and supportive because it's a lot of hard work. Uh, so you, it, you, I always say, I want to create an atmosphere where the writers are excited about coming to work, like I was on Buffy. Um, that's what I really want. I have a question, and then uh, I think Farouk has a question, and then after Farouk, Joseph has a Duda has a question. Um, but I'm kind of one of the things that scares me about the room is that I'm not very outspoken. Um, so how do you push yourself to throw out ideas, especially ones that you that you don't know if you know? Because you know, a lot of us writers already have you know self if, you know issues with ourselves or whatever self doubt. Sure, you know. Uh, it Way back when I was trying to break in, I used to joke to my friend, uh, the one who, who uh, introduced me to Roland Joffe's people that led to my first job. Um, I used to joke that I, I'm in the Steve DeKnight business and, and it became a joke between us. Uh, you know, I'm in the Steve DeKnight business, but it stopped being a joke at some point. Um, all of you have your work on the page, which is very important, but you need to be in the Rick McGovern business. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's, even if it's a slightly altered version of who you really are in public. Um, and I'm not saying be fake or phony, but, you know, take all the best parts of your personality and push them to the front. Uh, because again, it's, it's not just the writing you want the people hiring you to say, oh man, that guy would be great to be in the room. You know, just a lot of fun, uh, somebody that can really collaborate. So um, you, you have to kind of be on, uh, yeah. you know, and this is something that it took me a while to really, uh, uh, really zero in on because uh, a lot of my early interviews were terrible because I was so, tense and nervous and I really, really, really needed the job. And needing the job is something that can absolutely uh, collapse what you're trying to get across. And, and you come across as kind of uh, uh, clinched and, and a little desperate, um, which can make people uncomfortable. So it, it's a hard thing. I wish I could go back to my to myself when I was trying to break in and say, convince, your, convince yourself you don't need the job, that you're there purely to shoot the shit and talk about some ideas and have some fun. And I think I would have done a lot better then. But when you're actually in the room and it's tough, I, I don't know if I ever, you know, got over that hurdle of being in my own way. And, uh, uh, even now, if I was in a room, I'm not sure I would, but uh, it's tough. And, but I think the secret is really kind of the people around you, too. If you're in a really supportive room, like, look, if you're in a room full of professionals that you don't know and you feel intimidated by, which is usually how it starts, it's going to be harder than season two, when these people are now your friends that you grab a beer with, that you play video games with, that you talk to all the time, it's a lot easier to just bat around ideas and be open with your buddies, yeah. which hopefully the writer's room will become that. 
it's just trying to, you know, just feel the vibe. It, it's, I guess it's almost like catching a wave. I don't surf, but I imagine it is. You just got to feel the ocean and get in there and just go with the flow. Yeah. There's no simple solution to it. And, and you know, look, it, it's going to be uncomfortable at first, but, uh, you know, usually you learn how to swim. Yeah, that's my biggest fear, especially being an introvert. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, it, it's funny. I'm, I'm like a, a, an, an introverted extrovert, I guess. It's like I'm, I, I always think of, you know, the stories I read about Henry Fonda, who was painfully, painfully shy. And uh, Robert De Niro, apparently the same way. Um, a friend of mine finally got to meet Robert De Niro, an acting friend at a party. And he said, Robert De Niro at a party or anywhere he goes, he has this guy. I don't remember what his name was, but let's call him Bob. He's got his, this friend, Bob, that goes with him everywhere. And you go up and you talk to Robert De Niro. And you go, oh, Mr. De Niro, you know, I, I'm a big fan of yours. I love your stuff. He'll go, oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Have you met Bob? And Bob takes over the conversation so he can slip away. Uh, <laughs> so, but they have this persona of being, you know, so relaxed and open and it's just almost like tricking your mind in, in, into thinking that you're in a play, you know, and it's still really you, but just to, trying to, you know, disassociate yourself from the little voice in your head saying that, you know, you don't deserve to be here. You're an idiot. You're going to say something stupid. That's what goes through my head. And just, uh, you know, just opening up with the rest of the group which can be terrifying. I, I, I was terrified, yeah. but eventually it does get better. So actually, I actually want to ask one more question because the other thing that, you know, you talked about how you went to your friend and, you know, can you pass this on? Uh, mm -hmm. I'm not good at that. You know, when I was following up with you about stuff, you know, how I, uh, I usually well, waited like two extra weeks because, you know, I don't like bothering people. Um, yeah. I just have a hard time asking people for help. So um, how do, so how do you, how do you yourself, you know, it's when you tough. just it's ask, I, I hate doing that myself. Uh, I don't like imposing on other people yeah. and, uh, I, I'm always, uh, shocked and stunned on the, on the interweb, uh, uh, particularly on, on Twitter, uh, how brazen some people are, uh, that will just fucking pester me nonstop about, you know, can we do a project together? Can you read this? Can you do No, <laughs> no, no, I cannot. I don't have enough time to do my own stuff. Yeah. Um, but on the other hand, and listen, you should never, never abuse that. And I never, ever suggest approaching somebody on the internet, asking them to read your stuff. Um, for one thing, we just can't because of legal reasons about getting sued yeah. if we have, you know, any kind of similar idea, uh, you know, it didn't used to be this bad, but now, you know, people are litigious and they'll sue you at the drop of a, of a hat. Um, but uh, like with, with my friend, Lizzie Weiss, we were really close friends and I had never asked her for anything before that or anything since. And I made it very clear, and I think this is important, if you ask a friend to do something, it's like, look, if you feel uncomfortable for any way, I totally understand. Um, you know, uh, you, you don't want to push them into a corner or use your friendship as, you know, a bargaining chip for them to do something for you. And quite often, uh, like, like nowadays, uh, I, I will offer to, you know, uh, put people together or, you know, read something for uh, friends or coworkers of mine. Yeah. But it's hard when you're first starting out. When you're first starting out, really your best ally are your closest friends. Um, but again, you don't want to, you know, your friend gets a break and then two weeks later you're asking for a favor. It doesn't look great. Yeah. Um, like Lizzie and I had been friends for a couple of years at that point. So, it, and, it, and it wasn't, you know, I, it was just, would you pass this to your agent? Uh, yeah, you know, yeah. and thankfully, thankfully she did. Um, oh, I, I forgot the other part of that story. So uh, UTA turns me down 
Um, my agent sends it to Josh for the people, you know, I get hired on the actual show. Then my friend Lizzie calls me up after I've been hired on the show and, and said, Hey, my agent wanted me to call you. Um, they'd like to meet with you, uh, about them repping you, uh, if it's not too late. <laughs> so they turned me down. I got hired on the show and then I actually did end up signing with that agency. Um, and that's the other hard thing about getting a really good agent. Uh, it, it's that old adage. Um, when you need an agent, you can't get one. When you don't need an agent, everybody wants to be your agent. Yeah. And that's pretty much the way it happens. Um, if I hadn't gotten hired on Buffy, uh, I would not have gotten, you know, one of the big four agencies. And I got hired on Buffy, uh, you know, through a series of misadventures and a fluke and a pretty decent Buffy spec. Yeah. But sometimes you just have to, you know, very politely ask somebody to give you a hand. I appreciate that. Um, Farouk, did you still have a question? Yeah, I did. Hi, um, Stephen. Hello. Um, from the UK. And just first of all, I want to say thank you for everything that you've shared and everything that uh, you've been telling us. Um, your Twitter image is very intimidating, so I was very nervous to speak to you. <laughs> um, but my question is, is what do you look for in terms of when you're hiring someone? Is it just the script? Because you mentioned the spec script before, but do you want treatments? Do you want pitches? Do you want log lines, etc.? Does anything sway you one way or the other, or is it just the script? Yeah. Uh, just the script and the interview. Uh, quite frankly, as a showrunner, you barely have time to read the script. And uh, quite frankly, you're reading so many scripts. You know that, that old uh, saying about the first 10 pages, if you don't grab them in the first 10 pages, particularly true in TV when you're staffing a show. I mean, uh, I think the last show I did, I must have gotten close to 100 script submissions. And I just mm -hmm. can't read that many. Uh, but I, what I will do is I'll read the first 10 pages of each one. And, and if it grabs me, I, I mean, I think out of those 100 scripts, I may have read five all the way through. Uh, that doesn't mean that scripts I didn't read all the way through didn't get an interview. But if I read the first 10 pages, really liked it, I may skim the rest mm -hmm. and just get a sense that it's just as good. But it's, it's a time issue. There's just not enough time. Um, so then you set up the interview after that? Or do you ask for a treatment or a philosophy you know, or a Bible even? Yeah, I uh, never have time to read a treatment or a pitch or an outline. And, and quite frankly, uh, I'm not worried about, um, you, you know, especially in TV, basically you go from outline to script. Um, I, I, you don't do written pitches in a writer's room. It's, uh, mm -hmm. it's all verbal and talking and, and things like that. And for the outline, I, I don't worry about, if there's a good writer, if a writer wrote a really good script, um, I'm pretty damn sure they can write a good outline. And if they can't, it's the easiest thing in the world to walk them through. Mm -hmm. um, but really, it's it's all about the script is the first thing. That's the first hurdle. The interview is the second. Uh, the third has usually absolutely nothing to do with you, which is the composition of the room. Um, because you're dealing with, you only have so much money, you can only have so many uh, upper level writers, so many mid levels and so many lower level writers. So you've got to figure out the money. You also have to figure out the gender comp uh, composition of the room. Uh, I feel very strongly that I, I want the room to be at least half female, half male. It just makes for a better, <clears throat> excuse me, it just makes for a better room, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. And also, uh, I've always felt, excuse me one second. I've always felt very strongly about a very inclusive room. Yeah. Which is when I was on Spartacus, I was begging the agencies, can you please, and I apologize to the uh, white males in the audience, I am one too, but I was begging them, can you send me anybody that's not a white male writer? 
and I could not get anybody. It was like pulling teeth. It's, <laughs> and, and the reason was because white male writers were the ones getting hired. So that's the ones they were repping and that's the ones they were pushing. And uh, it, like with the, uh, with the female writer that uh, a friend recommended that I ended up hiring who had no experience, she was an Asian female writer. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it was just like the agencies were not set up to think outside of that box. Now it's completely different. It's, it's swung the other way, well, which I think is a good thing. And ultimately it'll even out. So everybody has a fair chance, which is what it should be. Um, but that's one of the things that will impact, uh, you know, it's the script, it's your interview and it's the composition of the room really. Mm-hmm. That comes then the composition of the room includes the financial comp- uh, composition. Um, but uh, the, the short answer is uh, I've never had to submit, nor have I ever read for a submission, any uh, pitches or any uh, outlines. Or uh, right, thank you. Quick uh, follow up when you're. When you're interviewing uh, the, the writers, because, um, you know, we don't really get m- much of that side of it. You know, we can talk about, you know, formatting or what you want to see in a script or wh- what's the process and stuff like that. But we don't get to really talk about the interview process. What is, is are you just looking to shoot the shit with somebody and just seeing if you can like gel or what are you looking for specifically? Yeah, you, uh, the interview starts as soon as you park your car, really. <laughs> when you're in the waiting room, your interview has started. Um, and this is also something uh, some, some, writer, some writers don't quite understand. Like when you get there and you're talking to the assistant or the PA, the interview started. Uh, because if that assistant or PA says, mm, that guy was a dick, then you're not getting the job. You're absolutely not getting the job. It, it's, it's, you know, for me, it's like whenever I see somebody uh, mistreating a uh, waiter or a flight attendant or something, it's like, oh, you're a dick. You know, uh, you don't punch down. Um, so it, it starts right then. And uh, look, different people have different interview styles. Um, I have a very loose kind of interview style. Uh, you know, yeah, I like to shoot the shit. Uh, I'll ask you questions. I'll, you know, ask you questions about your script, obviously. I'll ask you questions about your background, you know, where you're from, uh, where you went to school. And listen, where you went to school, it doesn't matter to me. I don't care if you went to an Ivy League school. I don't care if you didn't go to college. It doesn't matter. One of the best writers I've ever met did not go to college. It, it doesn't mean anything. Uh, you know, to some people it does. I don't care. Um, It's meaningless. It's what's on the page and and what you bring to the room. So really, yeah, it's, uh, and look, that's, that's my style. I've heard of some horrible showrunners who make you very uncomfortable, (laughs) but for me, uh, I want to make you comfortable in that interview because I want to see how you react to my style. And this is my style. This is, you know, I like to work hard, but I also like to have a lot of fun. And uh, without that fun element, I don't know why anybody would want to come to the office. Uh, You know, even back when I was on Angel, um, my boss then, uh, Jeff Bell, uh, who was fantastic and I learned so much from him. But that fun aspect was very important because we we set up an 18 hole mini golf course in our office because it was this huge floor with a lot of empty space. Um, and we'd be sitting in the writer's room breaking stuff and we go, ah, out of ideas yeah. and play 18 holes. And then we'd go for like two, two and a half hours and play 18 holes of mini golf and come back laughing and have a great idea. And on Spartacus, um, we, uh, we started with mini golf. Then we got rid of that and got a ping pong table and played like team ping pong. And then, uh, Quite frequently, I would, you know, call call it a day early, like at two, three o'clock in the afternoon, if everybody agreed to go home and sign on so we could play Halo. 
Uh, and, and to me, I just, I love having fun. Uh, this job is hard enough, but it, more than that, you want to foster that camaraderie with people. Uh, you know, you want, you will not get everybody's best work if they're dreading coming to work. That's just the worst thing. And honestly, <laughs> as a showrunner, I don't want to be there if I'm dreading it. Uh, so really the, the interview process, uh, and look, I'm not saying come in, you know, riding a unicycle and juggling, you don't have to be that kind of person. Um, but just know when you go in for that interview, the, the showrunner you're talking to, they want you to get the job. They, they, they so want you to get the job. Uh, every person that comes in, I hope just blows me out of the water and makes my decision for me. So it, it's not like you're going in and, you know, they're at, at least if you're, you have a decent showrunner, they're not looking to, you know, shit all over you. They want you to do well. And, and that's something I think is really important to keep in mind. And, uh, and of course, don't be late to your interview. That will kill you. I've had that happen many times. And, uh, you know, just, it, it, it sounds so cliche, but just try to be yourself. Well, I think I speak for all of us. We all want to work for you. <laughs> oh. I want you all to work for me. I really do. Uh, did you still have a question, Joseph? Um, yeah, I was just, you know, you spoke. Uh, first off, thank you so much for your time and Thank you for uh, Daredevil. I love that show. Um, I, my question is, though, like you seem to have a great experience with showrunners. And um, that was a great story about how the guy stuck up for himself. Um, and that's really my question is like, what's the how do you like sense of professionalism when you're trying to, you know, say stick up for a fellow writer in the room or just stick up for yourself if you feel that you're being abused? Like, how would you? I know that you've never had that from what you said, but how would you go about or what advice can you give to someone that's not right? You shouldn't treat people that way. If you see something like that happen, what's, what's your advice? Because if you, you know, get lucky enough to be in the room, I think a lot of people might be scared to say something or advocate for themselves. And just wondering if you have some advice for that. It's such a hard question and it's such a hard position to be in. I'm sorry. Yeah. It, no, I mean, uh, it's uh, it's tough. And I'm thinking about myself not as a showrunner. I'm thinking about myself as a writer coming up the ranks is what would I have done if I saw something that was And Look, I, I, I've seen I've been on shows where the showrunner was occasionally a dick, but not maliciously so. You know, it's a, it's a tough job and sometimes you're in a bad mood and you can snap at people when you shouldn't. And uh, a lot of times they apologize, which is great. But I, I've never I've never been on a show where there's been, you know, like the kind of outrageous uh, behavior where there's an investigation that needs to be done. Um, you know, I've never been on a show where the showrunners were either, um, you know, grabby, misogynist, uh, you know, creeps or racist or homophobic or anything like that. Um, I count myself very lucky. Uh, I've been on a show or two where the showrunner was very nice, but somewhat inept. Uh, but that's a different story. Uh, it, it's tough because look, if you speak out, yes, you're in a difficult position, especially as if you're a lower level writer, the higher you get up, the more cover you have, uh, quite frankly. But I, I, I've known co-executive producers on shows with uh, problematic showrunners of one I can think of again, I, I won't name names, but it was a very, very massively big hit show with a lot of Emmys. And the showrunner was notoriously problematic. And at that point, nobody really said anything because nobody wanted their career ruined. Um, it's a different climate now. 
Um, which can also go the opposite way. I also know a showrunner right now who is the sweetest, most supportive person I've ever met. And they have one of the writers who, um, you know, it depends on whose story you listen to, but they became very problematic. They got fired. And that writer continues like a campaign against the show um, we're knowing this person that's like, mm, I'm not quite sure what's going on, but this is not the person that I know. Uh, so it, it's tricky. You can also have sometimes people that are overly reactionary. And uh, I've worked with writers like that before. I worked with a, a writer who um, was very vocal in their displeasure about uh things that were more story related even if it wasn't their episode and were very aggressive with their feelings that what the showrunner was doing was kind of shit um uh more of a writing story level uh which is also no good <laughs> that's no good that's that's not going to look uh the, if you get on a show the showrunner multiple times a season is going to make decisions you will completely disagree with and you think are terrible ideas. Um, you know, you can politely voice uh, some concern, uh, but when they say, and I always say this, uh, you know, look, every ship needs a captain. And one of the things the showrunner, the most important thing they do is they decide what direction you're going. And I've had showrunners who couldn't make those decisions and that's deadly. Um, but by God, when the showrunner says, this is what we're doing and this is the direction we're heading, the conversation and argument stops at that point. And everybody has to get behind it and figure out how to make it work. Otherwise it's just chaos. But let's say you've got a showrunner um, that, uh, you, you know, is, uh, is a creep and is making the female uh, uh, writers and assistants very uncomfortable. Um, I, I think there's no, I think one, you have to go to HR with something like that and, and hope they actually handle it well. Um, HR to me is always, oftentimes it seems like HR is there to protect the studio not the actual rank and file people. Um, but listen, I mean, if you're standing there and your boss, uh, you know, inappropriately touches or grabs somebody or says something that's way over the line, I think there's no other choice. You got to go, whoa, whoa, that's not, uh, you know, that's not right. Um, and look, it, it puts you in a very, very tough position. Because obviously you are not going to be ingratiated, you know, the, to that showrunner. But uh, simple human decency, uh, I think, requires that. Um, but it has to be clear and egregious. You know, it, it can't be a, uh, the gray area is a very dangerous place to tread for everybody. Um, but I, I think that's an excellent question. I, honestly, when I was coming up through the ranks, people just didn't say anything because they were, you know, scared shitless. Um, uh, I know if I saw something like that now, I, I would not let that shit stand. There's just no place for it in, uh, in the workplace. And I'm, I'm extremely happy to see the showrunners that have been basically booted out because of that bad behavior. Um, and I, I just don't get that bad behavior. And I, I've heard a lot of bad behavior from my female writing friends about showrunners, you know, constantly hitting on them and by inviting them over for dinner and stuff. And that's, that's no good. Uh, you know, that just can't be. I, I also highly suggest everyone, uh, for the love of God, do not get involved with anybody in the office. Uh, not a good idea. It's, uh, and, and I, I, I speak from experience, <laughs> not a good idea. Um, you know, we all know how difficult relationships are. 
uh, throw in working in a very difficult, uh, pressure filled situation. It, it's just not good. I've also seen people get politely let go because of that. Um, you know, what, one person on a show I was working with, they weren't a writer on the show, but they worked, um, at a PA or an assistant or something and, uh, started dating one of the production coordinators on the show and uh, things went sideways from there and one of them was let go. Um, and, and, you know, look, the heart wants what the heart wants. Uh, you know, wait till the show's canceled. <laughs> you know, that's, uh, it's just, it's, uh, life's hard enough. Um, but more directly, yeah, look, it, it's not easy, but it's the right thing to do to speak up. And listen, there's also, it doesn't have to be the showrunner. It can be another writer um, who's misbehaving or saying inappropriate things or acting, acting inappropriately. I think in that case, uh, there, there is no gray area. It's just you say, whoa, that man, man, that ain't right. You know, you, you can't be doing that. Whether you say it right at the time or you take them aside. Um, but especially if, if they are... Um, attacking or saying things that are making another writer uncomfortable or an assistant or a PA absolutely appropriate in that moment to stick up for that person, especially if that person is a PA or writer's assistant or an assistant who doesn't have that kind of power. Because uh, most of the times with abuse, you will hear, you know, it's somebody higher up taking advantage of somebody uh, below them. Um, with the showrunner, it's, it's fraught with peril, although I think it's important for everybody to stand up for themselves and for others. With a, another writer uh, or anybody else on the staff, it's absolutely a no-brainer. You know, step in, make the person who's the focus of the abuse know that they're not alone. I think that's so, so important. Thank you. And, and try not to punch anybody, of course. <laughs> <laughs> as, as, as always a tough one for me. <laughs> yeah. Stephen, I've got a question about Spartacus. Yeah. Um, season two is like my favorite season of that series. Thanks. And I've heard that um, it was not heard. I want to ask you if it was planned that way to do a prequel before Absolutely. the third season? No, no, not at all. Um, it, you know, I'm sure everybody knows the story that at the, uh, you know, towards the end of season one, Andy Whitfield, who was a beautiful, beautiful human being. And, and uh, it was a phenomenal story because, you know, I mean, he, he was actually a structural engineer um, from the UK. And he fell in love with this woman and followed her to Australia. And when he was there, he started modeling. Uh, he, he did some, uh, some modeling for uh, jeans, I believe. Uh, blue jeans is the one I saw. And then he got a couple of parts in some really, really low budget horror movies. And uh, that's where he came on Rob Tappert's radar, my, my producing partner on Spartacus. And Robert, Rob Tappert sent me... Uh, uh, a copy of one of his movies and we took a look and we called him in to audition. Um, he was here in LA at the time. And uh, he was, he was such a, a, a sweet uh, magnetic soul and just quiet and wonderful and intense, but warm. And uh, on mute and I turned off my video. Okay, cool. Um, okay. Are you still there? Yeah, I try because I get the, because I get the, in the back. Oh, I guess I'm not on mute. You are not on mute. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, so, uh, yeah, you know, we looked all over the world for the, for the lead of Spartacus. And, and, and we took a real risk with Andy because he, he did not have the credits. His, his audition was good, but not spectacular. It wasn't like, oh, this is definitely the guy. We had a, we had a lot of debate. But uh, we went with him and he exceeded all of our expectations. He just was born for the role. 
And uh, he got a lot, a lot of love and a lot of publicity. And they were actually, uh, we heard rumors, they were mumbling about him as possibly the next James Bond, wow. uh, which would have been fantastic. And towards the end of the first season, Rob called me and said, uh, Andy hurt his back. And, you know, we got to be careful how we shoot him on the stunts. And um, he thought, Andy thought he had hurt his back doing a, one of the stunts. Um, and then after the season ended, it was still bothering him. And, and Andy was very much into Eastern medicine. So he was going through the whole acupuncture and, you know, a holistic approach, but it got so bad. He finally went to the doctor to get a cortisone shot in his back. The doctor poked and prod it and said, we need to do some tests and found out uh, he had non-Hodgkin's lymphoma which came as a horrible shock to all of us because he was a, obviously a super healthy guy in his thirties. Um, so w we were actually already working on season uh, two, which became season three, um, uh, the way it was laid out. Um, so we paused working on that season and we had a lot of debates about what to do. Um, the studio wanted us to keep writing, uh, but, you know, we were also worried about Andy. It was a little tough. So, uh, we knew we were going to be, it, it was going to be an extra year, uh, before Andy was through his treatments and came back, um, which would have been two years since we aired. And, uh, I was concerned, uh, we would lose the audience. So I suggested to Stars and Rob, we do a two hour movie uh, uh, to, you know, just keep, keep the show alive while Andy was getting treated. And uh, Stars came back and said, eh, two hours, it really doesn't make sense for us. So that died. We went back to working on the regular season and then uh, Stars popped up and said, what about four four hours, four one hour uh, episodes. And we thought about it and Rob and I felt like it's neither here nor there. It's too long to tell a concise story. It's not long enough to tell a, you know, full story. So that fell by the wayside. And then I think Rob and, and stars suggested six episodes. And for me, it was like, yeah, six episodes. I can do a prequel. Now, we had no plans to do a prequel. We had no idea what the prequel was going to be. Um, but we, we started talking about it and, and quickly figured out. We knew we were going to introduce Gannicus down the line because he's an historical character. Um, we had not formulated the whole Gannicus backstory at that point. That's something that we, we, we came up with um, really why we were giving Andy time to go through his treatment. Um, it turned out to be my favorite season of Spartacus 2 under extremely difficult circumstances, but there was something about it that just worked and I think made the entire show better by being able to go back in time. And, and not to mention, we got to have six more episodes of John Hanna and Lucy Lawless, which was pure gold. Um, we, I, I, I get, at the end of season one, stars started calling me up saying, do they have to break out? No, we really love John and Lucy. Uh, we think they should stay in the Ludus. I'm like, that's not the story. <laughs> <laughs> that's a different show. This is Spartacus. Yes, they have to break out. Uh, so uh, Andy went through his treatments. So here's the tragic part. Uh, I got a call that he got a clean bill of health. The cancer was in remission. And then we went to Comic-Con with Andy. Uh, and had a panel with him on it where we announced he was coming back as Spartacus. And then unfortunately, uh, his cancer came back with uh, absolute vengeance and he passed away. Um, but before he did, uh, you know, because we were thinking, well, let's stop the show, you know, let's just end it. But Andy was very adamant that he wanted the show to continue, that he thought the message was important and that he loved everybody on the show. And, you know, he, he wanted us to find a replacement. 
uh, which we did with uh, Liam McIntyre, who, man, talk about pressure. <laughs> that was a, it was a tough thing to come into, but he, he really pulled it off. Um, so yeah, so my very, very long answer. No, we had, that story was whipped up out of thin air uh, on the fly uh, to fill a gap. Uh, why we gave Andy a chance to go through um, his treatment. And I remember when it aired, uh, I can't tell you how many people were up in arms and angry. The angry messages I got about what is this? Uh, you know, this is Spartacus isn't even in the show. This is this is shit. And I, I'd have to explain Andy has cancer. He's going through his treatments. <laughs> you know, there's a thing called the Internet. You might want to run a search before you start yelling <laughs> about stuff. Um, but like you said, I mean, I think there was just. Uh, it, maybe it was the tragedy of what we were all going through personally with Andy's illness and just, you know, wanting to um, keep the show alive for him to come back, that everything just seemed to work. Everything worked in those six episodes better than I think anything I've done. It just, it was this weird, you know, nexus of creativity where it, just kind of worked, um, especially for something we had never planned. And like I said, I don't think the show as a whole would have been as good without that prequel. Uh, you definitely wouldn't have gotten the Gannicus that we ended up getting. And uh, oh. Dustin, Dustin Clare was uh, <laughs> stunningly good as that character. Honestly, like, I thought the season was incredible. I always loved Batiatis. And even there were small characters which I love, like Gaia, played by mm -hmm. Jamie Murray, which I think is a very underrated actress. She's been um, on. And I just really love that season. It's like my favorite season. And one of the things that impressed me the most about it was how he was a showrunner had to adapt to that situation and do uh, such a great season in that situation, which I, I I don't think I could ever do it, just the stress of it and just the situation of it. You'd be surprised at, at what you'll be able to pull out of your hat. Because when you, uh, look, ultimately, when you get into the business of a TV writer, it's with the idea, eventually you will have your own show. I mean, that's what, that's what you're driving towards. And once you have your own show, um, you will be, be presented with a hundred problems every single day. There'll be scheduling problems. There'll be the, you know, the, the actor you want is only available for this many days, or, you know, a lot of times actors or actresses on your show, they need to be released for like, uh, two months because, you know, they, they've just got cast in a Steven Spielberg movie. And you can't say no, you know, you don't want to stand in the way of that. So you got to figure out how the hell do I write them out for, you know, like four episodes. Um, this happens constantly. Actors get hurt. Um, you know, I, we, I've been witness to some other bizarre things of actors getting haircuts in the middle of an episode. Uh, it, it, it has happened. Um, I, I've, I've seen actors get plastic surgery in the middle of an episode, <laughs> which is, you know, things happen. Um, I remember when we were, uh, this was right before I was on Angel, um, but Alexis Denisoff had a, uh, uh, some kind of partial paralysis that happened. It was a bizarre muscular thing that he got treatment for. But, and you would never know watching the show, but for like a good chunk of the season, we could only shoot them for one side and you would never know. But this kind of stuff happens behind the scenes so often, locations fall through, you know, it's just, it, it, it's, it's a logistical nightmare. And this, this is why I, this, I also strongly, strongly advise don't ever say negative things about other shows, other writers, other artists on the internet. To me, it's just bad form, especially once you're in the business, you understand it is a miracle anything ever gets made, let alone anything good. Um, everything is stacked against you. Uh, the weather, everything. 
Um, it's just, uh, you know, people have, uh, thankfully now we can fix it, but I remember when I was doing, I was directing an episode of Smallville, one of our main actors, you know, a full adult in his late twenties ended up with a pimple that just kept growing and growing and growing. And we didn't have the CGI technology to take it out at that point. We just had to try to cover up with makeup and keep going. Um, now, of course, there's a lot of production sins you can fix in post. But uh, when you get to be a, a showrunner, you will constantly be faced with stuff like this. But, you know, uh, hopefully not your main actor getting cancer, uh, which is a, a bit on the extreme side. But um, you will be faced with problems large and small on a absolute daily basis. I, I remember uh, on Viva Laughlin, if you remember Viva Laughlin, it was on for about two seconds. It's a CBS musical with Hugh Jackman. Uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. I don't think you can find it anywhere now because only two episodes ever aired, but I was a co-executive producer on that and then got bumped up to co-executive producer uh, because me and the other co-exec took over the show to try to rein in the chaos. And, um, you know, one night at three in the morning, my phone rings and I'm half asleep and, and it's, you know, somebody from set, because there were two sets going on. There was a main unit and a second unit. And we were shooting Melanie Griffith uh, and she was kept waiting because nobody could find the sound guy. And they were waiting for an hour. The sound guy just disappeared. And, you know, I'm yelling on the phone, <laughs> where is he? And they finally find him. He had went to the second unit set, didn't tell anybody on main unit, and nobody knew where he was. Um, and so, you know, I had to start yelling that, uh, you know, to the line producer, this is completely unacceptable. We have to replace this guy because you cannot keep Melanie Griffith waiting for an hour. <laughs> I mean, that's a kind of a no brainer right there. Um, but these kind of things happen all the time. And when you are a showrunner, you know, uh, this is very hard if you have a spouse or significant other. The explanation that my phone can go off at three in the morning and I have to answer because it's a situation that, you know, we probably have about six and a half minutes to fix before there's serious financial repercussions. Um, so you, you know, it, long way of saying you may think you won't be able to handle that, but by the time you get to a show running position, you will, um, you know, you, you just, you have to problem solve on the fly. It's like being on set. Um, unfortunately nowadays with the short orders, a lot of writers don't get to go to set, which I think is a real shame because I, you really, it makes you a better writer when you see what it takes to actually turn your words into um, an episode of TV, uh, but on, on set, it's constantly that. It's uh, uh, things never go right on set. There's always well, one director uh, told me, always come prepared with a plan and be prepared to jettison the plan <laughs> and fly by the seat of your pants because something will happen. I remember when we were in China shooting uh, the sequel to Pacific Rim, um, a movie that was uh, it's like every bad thing you've ever heard about making a big movie. Uh, that was it. Um, we're in China and using a techno crane. You know, a techno crane is one that's uh, kind of a remote crane. Kind of you use uh, joysticks and wheels and you move it all around. Our techno crane suddenly goes bananas and it's just shooting out in all directions. And, you know, uh, people are warning you to stay away so you don't get to decapitated and uh so they have to shut off the automatic part of it <clears throat> and i i asked my uh my camera crew well can you fix it and they says yes we can <clears throat> and i said how long will it take and they say we can't touch it and i go what do you mean you can't touch it they go uh this crane is leased from the chinese government and we are not allowed to open it up so oh. we had to take this incredibly expensive techno crane pull it on a dolly track and have people push it around. <laughs> and that's the kind of so shit. Like a jib, right? Like a, like a moving jib then, right? Yeah. <laughs> and, and 
Yeah, we're shooting a That's game. insane. Oh, my God. Why? It was insane. But you can't wait for a new crane. It's just too expensive. You just have to keep shooting. Um, and, you know, every single day on set as a director is like that. Um, you know, you come with a shot list and a plan and storyboards. Then about halfway through the day, you're crossing stuff off that you can't do because you've run out of time because of weather or equipment or, you know, the prosthetics took an hour longer than you thought. And what, uh, it, it's... What's, so, <laughs> uh, what's the difference uh, when it comes to directing a film and an episode? Is that what you should? Uh, mo money, mo problems, basically. <laughs> I mean... Uh, <laughs> Uh, look, I, it's weird because I, I was not supposed to do a $150 million giant robot movie. That's, I, I still don't, it was a weird thing that happened. I was supposed to do an $8 million thriller that I had written with three people in a house. Um, that's was going to be my first movie. Uh, and I, uh, I set it up with Mary Parent at Paramount. And uh, it was so small, it kind of slipped through the cracks and we couldn't get traction on it. And then out of the blue, Mary called me and said, what do you think about Pacific Rim 2? And I thought she was nuts. I mean, <laughs> I've directed TV, but I've never directed a movie. Um, so I, I, I've got this kind of weird, I'm not the best person to ask because I went from episodic television to a $150 million movie that shot all over the world, um, which was a weird experience in itself. Um, as I discovered, you, you know, the bigger the budget, the more people are worried and, you know, get their hands on it. So um, I, it's another reason why I don't ever criticize big movies, particularly if they're a mess or a flop. It's because, yeah, I, I know how that happened. I, I know exactly how that happened. Um, really, the, the biggest, honestly, the biggest single difference is um, it's such a marathon because on an episode of TV, Generally, I'll shoot eight to 10 days, which I used to think was grueling. By the end of that, I was exhausted. I needed a break for like two weeks. On uh, Pacific Rim Uprising, my principal photography was 91 days. And then I shot another three weeks of pickups. Um, and, you know, this is I was shooting in Sydney and China. Um, so it's uh, it, it's almost inconceivable how you're so tired you enter into another you know mental state um and there's so many moving pieces especially i mean uh, when you do a big 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 action movie there are so many moving pieces it's insane it's absolutely insane um you're just trying to hang on by your fingertips and um it's it's not easy for me because directing is not first nature for me writing is um, you know, in writing, and I'm sure we've all experienced it, <clears throat> where you just fall into that creative groove and things are flowing. With directing for me, I wish I could say I was like Spielberg. I can come onto a set and figure it out and everything is, you know, phenomenal. Uh, no, I, I, it's hard, hard work. Um, I do a lot of, a lot of prep uh, uh, to prepare for it. But really the biggest single thing is the amount of time you spend directing and prepping. Like in an episode of TV, you write it, you prep it, you direct it, you edit it, you put it together. Uh, start to finish, that process usually takes two to three months altogether. Where with a movie, uh, a big movie takes three years from start to finish, like I said, with Pacific Rim Uprising, we were in a crunch because of release schedules and actor schedules. So we had to do it in two years. And I, I think it shows because things were a little half-baked. Um, but yeah, it, it, it's the time it takes. Uh, yeah, there's also plus pluses on it. Um, it's a big movie. I got to, you know, I lived for six months in Sydney, Australia. Uh, it was fantastic. Uh, I got to spend a month in China. You know, it was uh, it was really cool. And for the publicity and the premiere, you know, they they sent me all over the world, uh, which was great. Um, I also feel like I may have I may have gotten in just before that stops altogether. <laughs> it seems like I don't know when that's going to come back now. Uh, 
but yeah, it's just, it's, it's more time, more pressure. Um, and, uh, yeah, a, a lot more people breathing down your neck. Is that something you want to return to though? Not, not the big blockbuster movie, not that, I'm sorry. Moving towards like the, the small five to 10, $15 million kind of thriller or like, you know, character. Um, this may come as a shock. My movie did not do very well, uh, critically or financially. So, uh, so uh, I could say it's my choice to do smaller movies now. <laughs> you know, look, nobody's going to hand me another $150 million movie until I have a hit. Um, but yeah, no, I, I've been focusing on, uh, I finally got traction on the original $8 million thriller, um, which it seems like we finally got financing for. Hopefully I'll shoot next year. But after that, I've set up movies that, you know, it's, it's 8 million, uh, 20 million, 30 million, and one that's 60. So I feel like I'm going to, and also I honestly, uh, I feel like I need to drop back, do smaller movies and hone my directing chops before I would feel comfortable taking on a big movie again. Cool. Thanks. Thank sure. You. I have a question for you. Sure. Hey, hey, Stephen, how's it going? Good. Nice to meet you. Thanks for doing this. My pleasure. Uh, so I'm an actor. Uh, so the writing world, that's all you guys. But I did have a question that relates to if an actor has suggestions for uh, rewrites or something on the day. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have any advice for the writers in the room here for how to deal with that? Uh, yeah, well, it, it depends if it's a movie or TV. Uh, it, let's, let's say TV. If it's TV and a writer is covering the set, um, which is more and more rare because with a short order, they're usually on another job. But let's say I've got a show, uh, I'm here in LA and editing, and my writer's on set in Vancouver covering the set, and the actor wants to change a line. Um, this will not fall to the writer covering the set, uh, at least not, not on my shows. I always tell the writers, if anybody wants to change any line, and, and you know, look, it's not like a word here or a comma, you know, that's fine to flesh it out, but they actually want to change lines. They have to contact me um, because I don't want to put my writers in that position of okaying something and then I see it and I go bananas. And that's not fair to the writer. I also tell all of my actors that I hire, I say, look, my door is always open. If you want to talk about a scene, if you want to talk about a line, please approach me. It's a conversation. You know, look, this is a collaborative, collaborative effort. But I also tell them, just because my door is open doesn't mean I'm going to agree with you. And I, I've got a story about this. Andy Whitfield, at the end of season one of Spartacus, spoiler alert, I'm going to spoil what happens. <laughs> Um, uh, after, uh, after they kill all the Romans and Spartacus is killed body Otis, he has this speech that he gives uh, among the bodies to all the, all the surviving, uh, uh, gladiators and slaves that are now free. And he talks about how, you know, this is not what I wanted, but it's done. And, uh, and, and it, it was, uh, you know, it was, it was a nice size speech. So I get a call from Andy and, and he said, uh, Steve, I, I think I'm saying too much here. And I go, tell me more. He said, I just don't think Spartacus would talk this much in this moment. And I said, Andy, I completely hear you, but you have to understand that while you're talking, we're cutting to each of these main characters we've seen and how what you're saying is affecting them. And then he said, oh, OK, OK, I get it. He still wasn't crazy about it. But when he saw it cut together, he understood that it wasn't just about his speech. Now, I, I've also had experience uh, when I was on Smallville, um, the fantastic John Glover, who plays Lex Luthor's dad, who I, I cannot adore more. Every time he would get a script that he was in it, each writer knew John was going to call you. Um, he was very specific about but it, he would call you and say look I, I, I just want to make this you know uh, something that I'm comfortable saying in my own words and he would have these micro changes you know 
little word here, little word there, um, that didn't change the meaning of what was being said. It just made it something that he felt like he could act. And we were all fine with that. Um, I'm always fine with things like that. Now, I, I've also been in a situation where I, I get to set as a director writer. And uh, this happened once. Uh, the scene starts going and I'm, I'm looking at my script. I'm looking at the uh, script supervisor and we're like, the fuck is this? What's he saying? And I, I find out that the actor and one of my producers rewrote the scene the previous night and didn't tell anybody. Uh, that's no good, obviously. Um, I don't recommend that. Uh, but also, it really depends on the showrunner, the director, um, the producers. Uh, I always had, like with Spartacus, the language was so precise I had to come down on people several times that you cannot change one word because it's a very, very specific um, language we're using here. And uh, one of the actors had ad-libbed something about Caesar on a coin. And we had to call him up and go, you can't do that. Caesar's not on a coin yet. So you cannot be throwing in ad libs in a historical drama. It just doesn't work like that. Um, but yeah, in my early career, I was very, very draconian on set about people not changing one comma. I, I'm not like that anymore. Uh, it, it's like, look, if it means basically the same thing and it sounds better and more natural, fine. Um, but again, it's really the showrunner uh, or the uh, in the movies, the director producer that has to okay that <clears throat> the, the rank and file writer covering the set. Um, that's just a bad position for them to be in. They should always relay that request to somebody higher up. Uh, does that answer the question? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. Cool. All right. So he has time for one more question, which will come from Jamie. I know you wanted to ask a quick question. Yes, I did. Um, thank you so much for taking your time out to do this. I'm sure you're extremely busy. And I'm a huge, a huge um, Spartacus fan. Kill them all. Me and my best friend say that all the time when people are just being people getting on our nerves. We'll just text kill them all. And we instantly know what, what that means. So um, thank you for that. Um, my question is, when you're reading a script, because I've gotten feedback from like contests and things where you shouldn't use per parentheticals here or how your character just descriptions are here and what it actually looks like on the page. And I just want to know how much do you pay attention to that? Or uh, is it just about the story? Definitely should pay attention to that. Um, the, the formatting issues, nothing will give you a way of not being a professional writer faster than an incorrectly formatted script. Um, that's something that uh, professionals definitely look at. Um, there's also some other giveaways that's very simple to rectify. Look, parentheticals, I use parentheticals. It's just how much you use parentheticals. I overused them early in my career, basically directing the actors, which you don't want to do as much as possible. Um, unless it's really important, like you don't want to put, uh, you know, angry or, <clears throat> you know, uh, duplicitously or anything like that. Um, <clears throat> the, you know, really that should be saved for the director and the actor to work out unless it's vitally important. Um, scene direction is another thing. When I first started out, my scene direction was, uh, you know, huge chunks of, uh, you know, like a novel. And one of my professors always used to write, uh, save it for the novel on things like that. And uh, nowadays I've gone in completely the opposite direction on the, I just handed in a pilot where I've become kind of obsessed with boiling down my scene direction to what's absolutely necessary. And uh, Shane Black is a master of doing that. Um, you, can find it, you can find his scripts on the internet all over the place. And I really took a page from Shane Black and I decided no scene, no block of scene direction was going to be longer than two lines. And then I would break it up with another 
seen direction. And it was kind of liberating because uh, it really made me realize how much I was overwriting the scene direction. And this way I was, it, 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 it's also a much faster read. And um, it's, uh, there's something we always talk about when we look at a script, when a producer or a studio or something looks at the script, uh, we writers often talk about, we wanna see as much white page on there as possible, not huge, you know, bits of scene direction mm -hmm. stuff. And it's just, it's a psychological advantage um, because uh, even with myself, if I pick up a sample and it's just massive amounts of, you know, heavy, heavy blocks of scene direction, my first reaction is, Ugh, let me, uh, let me check out a, the next script and see if it's a little easier to read. Um, and, and the other thing is, uh, length, um, you know, uh, a lot of, the uh, uh, writers who are trying to break in, you know, They'll hand in a sample pilot or an episode of TV that's like 68, 70 pages long. And that says, ooh, that doesn't fly. Um, you need to, I strongly suggest, and look, uh, if you're writing a spec script based on another show and you get a sample of that show, like the Gilmore Girls were notoriously long. They were like in the 60s uh, for that, 60, 68, 70, because they speak very fast and it's a lot of dialogue. So if you research a show and get a sample script and it's that long, make sure you match that. But generally for a sample pilot or something like that, I always recommend shoot for that magic 55 pages, um, sub 60. Uh, and again, part of it is a psychological game for the reader who cracks it open. 55 is a solid hour of television. Um, it's not too short, it's not too long. Um, now, look, there's always a bit of a sliding scale. The pilot I just handed in was 50 pages because half of it is, uh, there's no dialogue. It's uh, all kind of very tense um, action, which tends to uh, film a little longer on the page. So it's not a set rule, but psychologically 55 is usually a pretty damn good number. And like I said, uh, uh, take a look at Shane Black's scripts and how he does scene direction and trying to boil it down to its, its essence where, you know, you don't want to boil it down so far that the reader is confused. Uh, but again, having all of that, you know, white paper in front of them means, excuse me, they will pick up a script and not have a sinking feeling that this thing is going to be like, you know, uh, reading a, a novel um, since usually the people reading it and you also have to remember you're one of 50 scripts they have to read over the weekend um, so you want to make it as enjoyable and as easy as possible all right well thank you steve uh one quick sorry You've Possibly been very generous with your time, and I just wanted to ask, if, is, is there any way that we can support you and look for something that you're coming out with in the future, you know? Yeah, and, yeah, you know, look, uh, follow me on the Twitter, all right. <laughs> and I will announce things that I'm doing, and uh, yeah, I, I would say check out my stuff when it's announced. And uh, I always, um, I'm always looking at other people's work and singing their praises. And so if you see that, please check out their stuff. Um, I only recommend things that I'm super excited about. Um, I, I have a general, usually if I watch something and my reaction to the creator is, oh, fuck you, that's fantastic. Um, you know, I definitely sing their praises. Uh, and, and, and again, it's so important this is another thing that I've started doing when I'm interviewing and looking uh, at potential writers. I will check out your social media accounts. And if you're a dick, if you're a QAnon nut, uh, if you are mean to other people, if you say horrible things about other people's works, uh, I will not hire you. And one last funny story. So I'm doing Daredevil. And I'm, I'm on Twitter and people are talking about, you know, oh, Vincent D'Onofrio, he's so good. 
And this guy out of nowhere just shows up talking shit about how terrible Vincent D'Onofrio's performance is. And I very politely say, well, you know, I disagree. I think he's really fantastic. And this guy just starts like heckling me. And then this other Joker joins in uh, with him, uh, attacking me, attacking Vincent D'Onofrio. So at that point, of course, I always check out to see who am I dealing with? Well, the first guy turns out is an actor. Uh, and he will never fucking be on one of my shows ever <laughs> because I, I keep a list of that shit. The other guy turned out to be, wait for it, his manager. <laughs> uh, so these chuckleheads are on social media starting fires with me, an executive producer, showrunner, and fucking Vincent D'Onofrio. <laughs> That's just stupid. Um, you, you know, I, I always say, uh, and actually, I, I owe this to my wife who uh, had me start doing this because uh, if you follow me on Twitter, you know, in the past, I've become uh, somewhat inflamed, particularly with uh, political situations, uh, which I have tried to uh, take a deep breath and not do anymore. Um, famously, uh, the, <laughs> my, my second final story, um, when I bought the house that I'm in now, you know, there's this crazy thing in Hollywood. I, I'm not like a major celebrity and I'm not super, super, super wealthy. Um, but anybody like in the business, uh, if you buy a house, there's this whole um, kind of sub business of, of, of creepy reporters that will report that you bought a house and what it's worth and where it is. And uh, this happened to me and uh, nothing could have been more surprising uh, because I, I mostly consider myself a normal guy that just happens to be lucky working in the business. But I wake up one morning, I wake up one morning and uh, <laughs> I, uh, to uh, this thing on the internet saying that, you know, Stephen S. Knight, uh, showrunner, director, has bought this mansion. Uh, uh, newsflash, it's not a mansion. Um, and, uh, it, and, and they go on to kind of sort of describe the house. And then they mention that uh, this was so weird. They mention that on Twitter, I told a fan to fuck off. <laughs> and I'm like, Wait a minute, that's very much out of context. Uh, and here's what happened. Uh, I don't know if any of you actually followed it when it happened. Um, a couple of years ago, they had an auction for uh, props from Daredevil. And I bought the Daredevil suit. Uh, of course I did. Why wouldn't I? It's the Daredevil suit, goddammit. Um and uh, so I, I, you know, a lot of people were upset about the show being canceled. So I posted a picture of the suit and I told everybody, uh, good news. The suit's in good hands. I'm going to keep it warm just in case. Uh, and this guy pops up and says, man, that, shoot was, that suit was shit. It looks terrible. It's awful. And I told him to fuck off. Now, I probably shouldn't have. Uh, and then I, then I blocked him. And then apparently he went on a rant about how I can't take criticism. Mm. Uh, <laughs> and uh, what I told everybody at the time, and I stand by, I did not block a fan. I blocked some random asshole on Twitter. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I, I regret saying fuck off. Uh, but to me, it was like, Jesus Christ, man. Uh, you know, it's, it's, and it wasn't like somebody politely saying, uh, oh, you know, uh, good for you. I wasn't crazy about the suit, but no, this guy was an asshole and he, he, he got what he deserved. But, uh, those things will come back to haunt you as I discovered with the announcement that I bought a house and told a fan to fuck off <laughs> all in the same, uh, little announcement. Uh, third final story. I'm at comma. Uh, was I at Comic-Con? No, I was at the TCAs. The TCAs is a television critics association um, where each year it's a dog and pony show with returning shows and new shows um, where they just, uh, it's usually at one of the hotels around town in one of their uh, banquet halls. And it's show after show after show rotates through uh, journalists ask questions. And then afterwards, you usually get a one-on-one -on -one 
Um, it, it, it's quite often a lot of fun, but we had one for Spartacus and we were going into the season, the final season where Marcus Crassus finally shows up. And uh, somebody asked me a question about Marcus Crassus. And I said, well, the interesting thing uh, about Marcus Crassus is that he had uh, the most slaves at the time, but he operated it like a business. He often paid his slaves. They often had houses and homes, and he would often rent out his slaves to other people. They were like a workforce that he had. And I said, uh, look, you could not have built Rome without the slave labor. It would not have been built uh, at that time. And that with Marcus Crassus, he presents kind of an opposing view of slavery where he's not uh, the kind of slave master, uh, the way we were presenting him, you know, with the lash and the rod and being horrible. He was treating it more like a business, still wrong, but you know, business. Uh, and, and, you know, that's where Marcus Crassus was going to be coming from, from trying to protect Rome uh, so it could continue to grow. Um, you know, which as you can tell, I'm talking about Marcus Crassus's point of view. Uh, a couple of days later, an article comes out that Stephen S. Tonight puts a positive spin on slavery. I'm like, what the fuck was that? <laughs> so, uh, you know, even, even when you uh, make it in the business, um, they will take things you say and twist them around. Um, and you, you just got to kind of roll with it. But my point is, be careful what you say on social media. Um, but more than anything, again, just try not to be a dick. Uh, you know, do not under any circumstances shit on other people's work. And I've seen my peers at my level do this and it drives me nuts. It's uh, I only talk about things I love um, in the entertainment business, uh, entertainment, art, comics, um, I'm not going to get on the internet and say why I hate it some movie or how disappointed I was by some TV show. It serves absolutely no purpose. Keep that shit among yourself and your friends because otherwise it will come back to haunt you. Absolutely. That's it for me. Great, great last advice. Thank you so much again awesome. for your time. Thank you guys. And uh, if anyone wants to say goodbye. Thank, thank you so much for your time. Thanks so much. Thank you, uh, so, thank much, you so, much, oh, thank you so, so much. You're very welcome, everybody. It's been a real pleasure. Thanks again. Have a good night. Yeah. You too. Thanks, everybody. Yeah.